Everybody here except Mr. Bateson, so we will get started. The recording has started. So good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the virtual Board of Finance meeting, Thursday, May 7th. Can we'll call this meeting to order? Can we please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, a comment to the public. If you call it, if you call to listen, you will not be heard by the board members, and there will be no live public comment. The public is encouraged to send their comments before or after the meeting to the following email: bof at fairfieldct.org. So tonight, we're going to first we'll approve the minutes from the multiple past meetings. We're going to review the latest Board of Ed document that was sent to us based on our questions, which laid out these, the COVID-19 expenses. And as we know, there's a lot of moving parts to this budget right now. We have the expenses, additional expenses to cover after this annual year. We have the savings that we reviewed um, a couple nights ago. We have a non-lapsing account we have to consider. We have to consider an MOU. And we have to consider the budget in general. So a lot of moving parts for the Board of Ed and the town for that matter. Uh, then after that, we will review documents sent to us today by the Finance Department at Town Hall. And when that is completed, as a board, we'll open it up to comments and questions from board members about the budget in general and any specifics the board will like to get into, if any. And we'll do that with our finance department. And then we're going to go into executive session to discuss liability and personnel matters. Uh, we'll have to vote to add that to our agenda, and then we'll have to vote to go into executive session. So let's start with the minutes. We'll go to item number three, to approve the following 2020 minutes, January 7th, February 5th, February 25th, March 11th, March 16th, special meeting, March 16th, a special meeting, and April 9th. And from what I can see, we only received um, back up from one of the April 9th meetings. It looks like a duplicate was sent to us. So we'll vote on one of the April 9th meetings. So can I have a motion to put this before us? Mr. DeWitt, seconded by Mr. Matola. And we'll start with January 7th. All those in favor of the January 7, 2020 minutes, say aye. Please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Um, there are cold cuts. I made a sandwich, so if you want a sandwich, have a sandwich. <laughs> Tis you okay. No, thanks. I have dinner upstairs. Oh, sorry. Am I not on loose? Okay. <laughs> Just for the sorry. record, that was not part of the minutes. <laughs> okay. Let's take a vote again on the January 7th, 2020 minutes. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none, it is unanimous. <clears throat> February 5th, 2020 minutes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? It is unanimous in favor. February 25th, 2020. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions, it is unanimous in favor. March 11th, 2020, all those in favor? Say aye. 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 All those opposed? Seeing none, it is unanimous in favor. Okay, 
Board of Finance special meeting minutes, March 16th. This one started at 7.05 p.m. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Opposed? Abstentions? Abstention. Okay, so we have eight in favor and one abstention. Mr. Walsh has abstained. March 16th, 2020. This is the meeting that started at 7.30. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Eight in favor. Mr. Walsh abstains. There were no no's. Okay, April 9th. 2020, special meeting, start at 7 o'clock. All those in favor? All right. All right. Okay, it is unanimous in favor. And the other back, the backup that I received is the exact same minute. So we'll have to uh, go back to April 9th next time we vote on the other meeting. Okay, that takes care. Of item number three, we move to item number four, which is public executive session, bu uh, budget deliberations. And so at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cummings, our superintendent of schools, and Ms. Vitale is here, the chairman of the board of ed. Thank you both for being here again tonight. You're welcome. And thank you for the document that, that you sent to our board. Uh, which is titled Anticipated Additional Expenses in Response to COVID-19 Distance Learning. And it's dated May 6, 2020. So last, uh, we, we had a detailed spreadsheet that we had received um, in regards to Board of Ed projected balances, of savings due to COVID-19, of some additional costs and then savings. So I asked the Board of Ed to go back and give us some detail on what the COVID-19 distance learning may look like for our next budget season, which would be 2021, and they have done so. So thank you for being here again, and if you could just walk us through this document. Certainly. Um, good evening, everyone. I, excuse me, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to this. Um, it, I, I, I'll go through the document, and then if there's any questions, please go right ahead. But uh, what we did, what we've been doing, quite honestly, is from the beginning of this, uh, going into distance learning, and as information has emerged over time from the state around, um, somewhat around, basically building around timelines and anticipated timelines, um, we've been thinking about how we're going to <clears throat> respond to um, different scenarios. Uh, we're, we're listening certainly to the uh, guidance that we're getting um, that says, uh, well, one, we're not going to be in schools for the remainder of this year, but two, going forward, um, when will we be back? What, the, what does summer look like? Is summer going to be uh, an opportunity to be physically in school, hold physical summer school, or will that be some combination of physical summer school or, or distance learning? And then when will we be back in the school year? Um, a lot of the guidance tells us that we're, we should anticipate additional closure periods uh, through the 2021 school year. So we're working out a number of these scenarios in preparation for that. So. Um, Going through the document, I, I've mentioned pre previously to you the idea of computers in grades three through five. We had budgeted for some uh, Chromebooks. We would reallocate the ones we're budgeting from their initial allocation, and then we would have to supplement um, 1,148 machines for, to um, cover our, our uh, students in grades three through five and, um, and make sure that we were one-to-one -one in that case. And, th and that's that would go into place whether we're in distance learning or not, but we anticipate again um, having the need for those machines. We have we have supplied, just so you know, we have supplied machines to anybody who did not have one this year, but we are thin, very thin, and we also have a number of machines coming to end of life. So um, we want to be ready for that need. 
<clears throat> with that, um, we also are struggling right now to provide reading materials, particularly for the elementary grades and in particular the primary reading gra uh, primary grades. We had um, envisioned some type of book exchange program. We were in process of developing um, ideas around using the um, free and reduced lunch sites to provide classroom libraries or book bags of books for kids that they could pick up. But the, we had um, we were concerned and we were told to be concerned about the possible transmission of the virus through um, the text. So we had to end that idea. And uh, we have a number of families that are um, that are lacking reading materials. If we were able to provide textbooks, true, real books um, to kids, we'd be fine. But because we're not able to do that, we, we are looking at um, options of providing um, online reading materials for them. And then right now, um, a lot of the providers of computer applications and software have offered their products for free um, at the onset of distance learning. But that is not going to be um, uh, going to continue uh, for much longer, and we anticipate that some of the things that we are we would need that we used extensively during this period of distance learning, we would want to continue to use. And I've given you some some sense of what those are in the description and the notes there. And then, um, so that's that's kind of the material aspect of, of the list. The, the other part of the list is really based around remediation efforts that we would undertake, that we feel we need to undertake. And I wanna make a differentiation here. There's, there's extended school year, which is the first uh, number four on this list. That is uh, a summer program. We have budgeted uh, in the 2021 budget, we had proposed um, initial spending of $625,000 for that. Um, but we're because of the nature of the long-term closure, because of the fact that we know that we're going to need, to need a longer program and and meet more needs of more students, we've had to expand the footprint of that program for both its uh, in its its length of time and its um, uh, uh, length of days. Excuse me. So that's the extended school day. We run an elementary summer literacy program for the early primary grades, K-2, uh, students coming out of K-2. through two. We would want to uh, look for a couple of additional teachers for that. That's the fifth item, the $6,125. A lot of that program is already paid for with Title I funds, but we, were, um, we would need additional funding for additional students. And then on the, on the second page or the back of the page, um, we believe we're going to need additional support for high school summer school. Um, we have students that we know have not been able to keep up with their work through distance learning. Um, and we're going to have to support keeping those students on track to graduate on time. So we think that we're going to need additional funding for credit recovery type programs at uh, summer school. Um, this would also include um, uh, special ed students as well as regular ed students. And then to differentiate the extended school day, the last two items on, or excuse me, the second to last, second and third to last items, or I'm not even saying that right, but the extended school day um, would be additional hours. Once school begins, we feel, we see a need to further supplement remediation for students by um, extending the school day. So, so primarily this is a special ed effort that would require uh, additional transportation. We require additional nursing services and obviously staff. And then again, with that, we bookended a regular ed program that would take advantage of the fact that we already have the buses and uh, nursing available. So um, we're looking at uh, looking at a 20, 20 week program to do that. So that's the extended school day. And the final issue is uh, masks. We are gonna be required to provide masks for all of our staff we're going to be required to provide masks for all of our students. We're going to have to be, we are going to be required to provide masks for any visitors to the building. Um, and right now, the current price we have on those is three dollars. So that's the list. And I don't know if there's there's questions you want me to go into or you want to get into on that. I, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes, thank you, Mr. Cummings. What I think we'll do is just start from the top, and I'll ask the sure. board if there are any questions uh, for each category. Um, so let's start with computers. 
grades three to five. Are there any questions for that category of expenses? Mr. Testani. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair. This is Jack Testani. Mr. Cummings, I think we've touched on this, but just so it's clear in my head, um, this is sort of a general question. These are all outside the parameters of any potential COVID-19 reimbursement. Is that fair to say? Um, they, uh, Mr. Testani, they could be within that. Uh, we're waiting for further guidance on that. Um, we are going to get around a little short of $300,000, as it appears, for COVID-19 related expenses. Um, we are keeping track of what those are. I mean, that's related to the cleaning equipment, the cleaning supplies, um, some of our uh, staffing needs. So um, it's possible that those funds could cover this. Um, it's possible. When you say possible, when, when was the latest feedback you've received from the state or who, how are you receiving information about the application process and the reimbursement process? All we've gotten so far is the guidance from the state has been put everything that you think could be met by this need or this uh, by this legislation into a account for it in a separate account. Um, but other than that, there's been no further guidance and there's uh, no application process. We understand that the funding could come at some point in 2021. We've not been told when. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Tistani. Any questions on this particular expense? Computers, grace three to five, cost of $254,000. Mr. Walsh. Mr. Cummings, um, thank you for being here this evening. And you and I had the ability to ask, I asked you a couple of questions regards this today, so I'm not gonna repeat everything, but um, in regards to the computers, you had mentioned earlier today that these computers from grades three through five, 1,148 would be become <clears throat> not only needed for COVID, but you will plan on making them a part of your permanent curriculum, correct? Yeah, if we're going to buy those computers, we would want them to uh, be part of the instructional materials that students would use, yes. Okay, as an ongoing basis, is there gonna be some cost that's not built into the, the budget, or your budget that we're looking at for next year that won't be in there other than the cost of purchasing the computers? No, we've, we've talked with our uh, IT staff. We believe we'll be able to cover any, any uh, maintenance or ongoing support for these computers with existing staff. Um, uh, so that should be covered. Okay. All training, as we discussed this afternoon, will be handled during professional development, so there won't be any additional training of teachers in grades three through five. It's not baked into the budget. That is correct. We would cover it with existing hours and existing staff, any professional development that were to occur. And there will not be any additional costs for any type of additional software that the teachers in grades three through five will need, correct? Nothing that's not enumerated in the next uh, item or down below, two items below. Yes, okay, I agree. And that there won't be any additional IT staff that are needed in your uh, program at all. That's correct, that is correct. Okay. Is there gonna be an additional cost going forward with, because this is obviously a, a change, major change I see in your programming going forward and that you will now be offering this, these computers going forward with the program. They're gonna be an ongoing cost year to year to be maintaining computers from grades three through five. We, we maintain, uh, we are able with, it, with our IT staff to handle a lot of the repairs that do occur. Um, we have good, a good warranty uh, agreement on, on the Chromebooks. Um, but Mr. Walsh, I would also say that the, the district is looking into uh, an, uh, an insurance program um, that uh, we would have parents essentially pay a fee for to, to ensure the, uh, the, mach the machines that their students use. Okay. Will a child keep their Chromebook, their, the same one that they have from year to year for the five years that these last, or will they all come back into the district and different students would get a different Chromebook every year? 
No, we've we've have found this year that the students um, maintain they keep their Chromebooks. They keep their Chromebook from year to year. It, it, it they take better care of it that way. We believe. Okay, so every year after this, when you hit third grade, you'll have to buy new Chromebooks for that entire third year class district wide. That's that's possible, and it would depend on, in a sense, the age of the Chromebooks that the graduating class is turning back. Okay, in. agreed. But and there will also be after the fifth year of purchase of whatever ones were five years old, you'll Definitely. be probably replacing those. Miss Miss Burns, I will point out, Miss Burns, um, our IT director, did get an extended one year warranty from HP on our Chromebooks, so we're going to be able to get a six year out of many of them. Uh, and I, that's it. I think you answered most of my other questions uh, this afternoon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, hey, thank you, Mr. Walsh. Any further questions on this expense? Seeing, seeing none, we'll go to the elementary online reading books for 38500 Any questions on this expense? Seeing none. Go to the third item, program applications and software for $44,846. Any questions on this expense? Seeing none, we'll go to the fourth item, extended school year for $675,000. Any questions on this expense? Mr. Walsh. Um, just so my other fellow board members know, you and I, Mr. Cummings, have spoken this afternoon in regards to, I think, that one and then the next few about the extended summer school program, mm -hmm. those three categories. And you, I just want you to kind of confirm this, or you can espouse upon it if you'd like to, but you really don't know what's going to be happening this summer because you might not be able to have a, a program that's in the school. So you said that it might be the program that you have kind of detailed here. It might be a hybrid program and it might be a distance learning program, but one way or another, you will have the program. You just don't know where that's going to go. That is, that is correct. We're, we're aspirational perhaps in our thinking. We, we, the best program we can offer is one that would be in person. Um, you know, a physical program with students coming into the school, but it, that's our timeline. It may not be the state's timeline. Um, I do have, if if you want, I can read these to you, and then I can follow up by sending these um, these figures to you, so you don't have to write them down. But I, I we looked into, Mr. Mancusi, our special ed director, had developed some iterations of this. So, as Mr. Wall said, the the figure given here is the figure of a of a in person physical class uh, program. We looked at a couple different options, right? So. If, for example, and I apologize, I'm just going to turn here to read this. Um, if we were only to do, um, uh, let's see, a four-week program, um, and it was distance learning, that would be, that total of a four-week program would be $578,934, so just shy of $580,000. A three-week program would be $530,901. And again, I'll, I will email this to you after, the, after I get off. And then in two, a two-week program, if we're only able to give, uh, um, be physically together for two weeks, that, that cost would be $482,868. And if only, if only we could do what distance learning uh, for the entire length of the summer, and we were not able to offer the physical program at all, that cost would be $181,200. And, and that, again, is the, the great drop in the cost is because we don't have the transportation, we don't have the online, we don't have the nursing, and we, we probably would ha require less staff. So, again, I will email that to you so you have those things for you. And some of those costs have to do with the busing and things like that? Absolutely. That's, that's a great cost. Are you finished, Mr. Walsh? Yes, I am. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Marmion. 
Thank you. Mr. Walsh um, partially got to some of what I wanted to talk to you about, which was the transportation costs um, that are, you mentioned in the extended school year program that you're including the transportation costs in your, in your total. Um, but I guess overall, because then we're looking further um, in terms of summer school uh, for the high school, extended school day, uh, regular education elementary, extended school day, special ed, et cetera. Transportation is a huge cost, you know, in the budget. Do we have flexibility with our transportation contract in terms of ebbing and flowing um, with these programs as they change, but also just overall, say if, for example, next year, we start in school, then we have to go to distance learning and we don't need the transportation and then we go back to school. How much flexibility do we have with our transportation contract in terms of services and costs? Um, we don't have as much as we would think. Um, part of the CARES Act and part of the governor's executive order, and I apologize, I forget the exact number of that executive order, um, but essentially, we are required, all school districts are required to negotiate with their transportation contractor um, some type of settlement. So just because school ended doesn't mean we don't have to pay them. Uh, and right. I believe that this was primarily done to, you know, obviously to keep um, salaries coming in for the drivers. So we're in the process of that negotiation now. We have, with both our, our both of our bus providers, the, the, the first student who handles the majority of the runs as well as the company that handles a lot of the special education runs. Okay, so it's a it's a moving target. It's in flux, but you're going to try to nail down. I guess you can't be specific because we don't know what's to come. But you're trying to negotiate some level of flexibility into that contract. Is that what you're telling us? No, no what I'm what I'm saying is. Uh, well, we may try to do that. I don't know if it's going to be superseded by government action. If we don't have a summer program, we're under no obligation. I want to separate out the school year from the summer program. If we don't have a summer program, we don't, you know, that's not part of the, we have a contractual rate, but we don't owe anything for not having a summer program. It's only the school year that, that at this point anyway, that we've been required to pay. Okay, are you working with other superintendents to, as they negotiate these contracts as well to try to figure out how they're going to work in different districts? It might be helpful to know what, what's going on in the other districts in terms of these negotiations. We are. The, the school business uh, officials uh, organization in the state is doing that. Uh, and also, Ms. D.C. is working with uh, the town attorney around the, the bus contract negotiations in Fairfield. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, hey, thank you, Ms. Marmion. Any other questions on this item, extended school year? Okay, seeing none, elementary summer school regular ed, $6,125. Seeing no questions, high school, some, high school summer school regular ed for $25,000. Mr. Matola? Thank you, it's John Matola. Um, this is kind of related to that. Um, Mr. Cummings, what are you gonna do to, I see you're gonna be able to maybe assess the effect of this closure on elementary school students, um, special ed, it looks like. What are you gonna do for, um, for example, high school students who are in the regular program, who have missed school for about 70 days this year and have done distance learning. How, mm -hmm. how, are, you, how are you, and maybe it's going to be very difficult to do it, how are you going to assess what, if anything, those students have lost by virtue of having this distance learning happen over the last two, two and a half months? Um, what we're anticipating, uh, I'll, I'll pick math for an example uh, because it probably presents as the most clean example. Um, first of all, I would say that I, our, based on the conversations we've had, our, 
you know, our curriculum leadership has had with the classroom teachers. The, the feeling from the classroom teachers is at both the middle and the high school level is that the great majority of students have maintained the learning and that they feel very comfortable that they're going to end the course on par with where they would, where they would end if we were in school. Um, I think there's exceptions to that. Um, but I think for the most part, our staff has um, feel strongly about that. Now, I do say though um, that, and I am concerned that when students do return uh, and, and staying with math as an example, we're going to we're going to need to do a pre-assessment at the beginning of the year on the prior year's expected learning, and we're going to have to start where the kids are. That may mean that um, we're going to have to look at what's called compacting the curriculum next year in order to identify the most essential things that students need to know and be able to do, um, particularly if we're pushed into distance learning again. So um, that, is, that is really the intent. And we're, we're looking at um, some work this summer um, to, to engage staff at the middle school and high school in that, that curriculum compacting so that we're ready for, for that livelihood. Um, I think you will see different needs at different levels of classes. Uh, but that's where we plan to go. Okay. Um, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Any questions on high school summer school? Okay, going to the second page. Extended school day regular ed elementary for $132,000. Any questions on that item? Seeing none, extended school day special ed for $647,500. Any questions on that line item? Mr. DeWitt? You're on mute. Okay. Just, just reading it. <laughs> uh, actually, I do have a question. Mr. DeWitt? Yeah, Walter Fitzgerald Camps is mentioned here. Is are are we really considering opening up Walter Fitzgerald Campus, or would we not try to integrate those children into, uh, um, you know, one school for the extended school day? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the problem with that would be it would, it would potentially require additional transportation. You know, they're finishing the day there, so we'd like to uh, continue them there. And plus, we staff there later in the day anyway for, this, for the uh, partnership program. So the building is open and the kids are there. Okay. All right, got it. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. DeWitt. Any que further questions on extended school day for special ed? Okay, seeing none, we're on our last item. On this document for the mass, thirty-six thousand dollars, twelve thousand mass at three dollars each. Questions on this item, Ms. Marmion. Just give us an idea of what you're considering here. Is this like a, a string mask, a universal mask that they keep for a day, a week? in perpetuity like what's the what's the wearing schedule for the mask well the, what we're looking at is this would really be a kind of a, a one per customer mask i suppose um we're going to have to come up with uh, a protocol around these uh you know it's going to be kind of students um school issued equipment i would imagine um our students being our students or staff being our staff that the uh the model we provide may not meet um, bling requirements, but um, you know, I, I imagine people will, will fashion their own or bring their own, but we, we have an obligation to make sure that everybody who needs one is given one. Um, st uh, visitors who arrive without a mask are gonna need to wear a mask. We're gonna have to figure out a protocol to collect those back and get those cleaned. Um, so again, this is, this is a regulatory issue we're responding to. 
And I, I think we're going to go for something that, you know, I, I would say to you, given the, the, um, the longevity we're hoping to get out of them, we're looking for something that's going to have some durability. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Marmee. And uh, Mr. Testani, and then Mr. Matola. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, Jack Testani. Uh, Ms. Cummings, I'm just curious, with the Mass, there have been many organizations that have put together donation programs. Has anyone from the Board of Ed looked into a potential donation of masks or for that matter, any of these other items as well? Uh, no, we haven't We haven't done that. I mean, we've been in the process of donating our own masks. So uh, I'm not aware yet that, that masks are available for schools at, at this point. Um, it's something we could certainly look into. So I'm sorry. So, so just to be clear, you're, you're saying you're donating masks, but you're asking for thirty-six thousand. Well, we gave right? we gave our masks back uh, more than a month ago when masks were in such short, short supply. The masks right, that we had, right? Yeah, no, I remember. Yeah. 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 So, have we looked into trying to to get them? Um, you know, reimbursed or or donated. I guess is the word I'm looking for. We we would have to we'd have to look into that. It's absolutely something we can do. Okay. It seems like a Thank lot you. of money. Uh, Three dollars yep. a month seems like a lot. I was they, choking. I was writing it down. Yeah. Huh. Okay. Maybe there would be some way we could find a specialized mask for a little less than that. I think 3M is selling them now for like a dollar a mask or something. Okay, but, that'd be great to have. Something to certainly look into. Yeah, that, that's the price I had was based right now on our, our, our latest, uh, I think it's on the bid pro, uh, document from the state was $3. If we can get them cheaper, we'll get them cheaper. If we can get them donated, we'll we get them get donated. Them cheaper. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Testani. Mr. Rotola. So I, I, I appreciate what you're saying on the math. Are, are you... Have you been told by the state that come September, when school starts, that everyone's going to have to wear a mask in the building? Is that like a given, or you just don't know yet? Yeah, we just don't know, but we've been essentially told to prepare for that. Gotcha. Okay, fair enough. And that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, why why in the world would we have to give a visitor a mask when they're coming into the building? Wouldn't it be more politician prudent to say if I'm showing up to drop something off for my son and I don't have a mask that you just say you're not allowed in the building, as opposed to saying, here, Mr. Matola, here's a $3 mask courtesy of the Fairfield Board of Education. That, that's yeah. all I'm trying to say. Yeah, no. If, if you, we have, at the schools now, if, if somebody forgot their lunch, there's those uh, drop-off carts in front of all the buildings. Yeah, I so know. That, yep. It's more now, for, for example, if, uh, if people arrive for a, a – uh, PPT, uh, those types of things, um, we would have, we'd have to have them ready. Just in case. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And again, it's, I, it's I, part of the requirement we've been, we've been told. Okay. I, fair enough. Thank you. Yep. Any further questions on this expense? So I, Mr. Cummings, is this for every teacher, every administrator, every student has to might need to wear a mask every day. That's correct. Because you're going to need more than 12,000 masks. Uh, we probably uh -huh. will. I mean, that was the initial number. We, you know, we've got 9,600 kids. We've got around 1,000 staff. And then we, we put in some additional to basically for visitors and some replacements. Um, but I say it, it might be a conservative number. Um, and, and, again, how, lo how long – is this requirement exist right i mean those are we're all dealing with this how long are we going to have to deal with these these expectations i mean i i'm just this is obviously far from the largest cost but this is a right. cost that can add up very quickly it, because yes. i tell you i think i've been through four of these masks myself i mean they break you lose them and if we're required to, if we're, if it's our responsibility to hand these out, you could go through thousands of masks a week. 
could be it's real. Just big. It's, just, it's just a concern, and yep. I agree. I hope this doesn't last. Uh, that requirement, is, if, if it happens, doesn't last very long. Okay. Any other questions on any other item, Mr. DeWitt? So, Mr. Cummings, thank, thank you for this. Thank you for this list. Um, it's um, I, I looked at it today, and um, uh, it's it's very comprehensive. I guess what what I'm wondering about is there's a lot, lot of moving parts here, a lot of teachers and a lot of students and a lot of facilities. You know, um, so you know, what, what's the probability of us actually? Spending 1.858 million dollars. I mean, I and and listen, I I understand that it's a it's a timing thing, but but even if everything were open up, it seems fairly unlikely to me that we could execute all this. It seems just like a lot of stuff to do in I don't know how many weeks of summer are there? 15, 17 weeks? No, no. Uh, there's about practically speaking, there's about uh, eight, you know. Oh, Jesus, eight. Okay, so even even more, right? Yeah. Um, I, 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 you know, Mr. DeWitt, that's really the question we're struggling with. We, we're trying to, uh, I guess in one way, what I, what I can interpret your question as, is, is, and, and this is how I'm interpreting it. I'm not trying to say this is how you're, you're saying it, but it, it, it's, is, this a, is this an idealistic vision of what we we need to do or what we feel we need to do. I, I would say to you, I think, I think this is what we feel we need to do. Um, if, you know, I, I, I think I said to you, if, if we're wind up having to provide an extended school year program that's entirely distance learning, roughly speaking, that's a $500,000 difference in cost. Um, we're, we're mindful of the work that you need to do, um, but at the same time, you know, in, in doing, fulfilling our mission of doing what's right by students, we don't want to be caught short. Um, and we're, we're uh, um, you know, I, I can't put it any other way, but we're, we're going with what our best guess and our best needs are. But I can't, I don't know what's going to happen. I really don't. And none of, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I could give you a better answer than that. And I apologize. Yeah, well. Let me tell you exactly where I'm coming from, right? So I've got this spreadsheet, and it says, here's the original Board of Ed budget number, and then the Board of Selectmen took it down number, and then you guys are going to need summer school. I mean, I'm trying to just tally it up, and then yep. we're going to get $2.5 million back. You know, I'm trying to do the puts and takes. And that's the, the, the total of this number is significant, because if if we agree that this non-lapsing account should be 2.5 million, just for talking purposes, and you really spend all this money, you know that gives you about seven hundred thousand dollars. I mean, you you probably take that 2.5 million dollars and it, it it would be practically gone. So, it, and and I know I know it's difficult to to give the under over on this, but. Um, it just seems to me, especially now that you say it's an eight-week period, that we could spend $1.858 million in that time. I mean, uh, I'm not saying we couldn't spend it. Don't get me wrong. But right, right. I don't think we could accomplish what we think we we should for, for that money. Now, that's it for me, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll let Ms. Ms. Vitale jump in here. Ms. Ms. Vitale. Christine Vitale, um, Chair of the Board of Ed, thank you. Um, to Mr. DeWitt's point, you know, we don't know. You're right. We could not be back in school this summer. But I think that just means that maybe when kids are back in school, there might be another list of scenarios in front of you. That's um, what I'm talking about. Just, you know, a longer day for more students, um, an extended school year on the other end, potentially. And I know that's just giving you more things to think about and more different scenarios, but that's really what, you know, we have been faced with. And I say we, I really mean um, staff has been faced with. I mean, just in some conversations with 
chair, board of ed chairs from around the state, there's been all sorts of scenarios um, being thrown out there. You know, half of students go in the morning, half of students go in the afternoon, when ha every other day, which brings in increased transportation costs, smaller class size, which could lead to needing more staffing. Um, I'm not suggesting that any of those things are going to happen here in Fairfield, but those are the types of scenarios that we just need to plan for moving forward. Um, and saying that, I appreciate that it just makes your job that much harder. But um, I'm not afraid of this money getting spent to, to meet the needs of students during these very, very challenging times. Thank you, Ms. Vitale. Uh, Ms. Marmion. Thank you, Sheila Marmion. Um, Ms. Vitale just kind of um, touched on what I, I'm interested in. I'm sure you're doing scenario planning. Uh, you know, you're coming up with all of these different contingencies and, and trying to come up with some plans. One of the things that I'm wondering if you're taking a look at is um, the governor, um, the governor Lamont's task force yesterday came out with um, a phased plan for higher education. And part of that included mandatory guidelines around social distancing and density in classrooms and dining halls, et cetera. And Ms. Vitale mentioned, you know, that you're looking at maybe one day students you know, students A go to, you know, Monday and students yep. B go to Tuesday, et cetera. Um, so I'm, a, I'm assuming that this is something you're looking at, given that the governor was talking about higher education, but that you're looking at, um, you know, how this might work K through 12. Um, because social distancing, you know, that might go away in the short term, maybe over the summer, but it might come back. And that really opens up a whole nother can of worms in the cafeterias and in the classrooms, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, I just wanted to mention that because I know Ms. Vitale said, again, this is a moving target and you're coming up with scenario planning and you don't have answers now, but, you know, this is, I'm sure, a real concern expense-wise and planning -wise. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Ms. Marmy. And we'll go to Mr. Matola, then Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Um, I, I was just going to say that um, this money here and more, in my opinion, is going to be spent on COVID-related expenses. It may not be exactly this because things change, but it, it's certainly going to be at least this much, if not more money, in, in my opinion. I, and it's, it's so hard to nail down. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised... God forbid that during the school year you may have to come back to us and say, "Let's so we need to do A, B, and C because of you know X, Y, and Z, and we need help." So I I just think that this is scratching the surface, unfortunately. I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matola. I hope you're wrong as well. You, you, you know, we have the savings, we have these expenses, and we have a budget. And we only have so much funds to, to cover everything. Um, Mr. Walsh. Uh, first of all, following up on what Mr. Matola said, yeah, there could be there could be more expenses, depending on what happens with the school year, from talking to Mr. Cummings this afternoon. If the kids don't go back in the fall, there'll be significant savings again, only to be probably rolled into the next semester or the next summer. And it's gonna have to be something we kind of roll with. But I think as we plan for this, all we could really deal with is the numbers that are before us. And if we are to do an MOU of some sort and roll this $1.8 million into the account we're talking about establishing, almost 1.9, um, we kind of have to have some sense of how it's going to be spent, um, giving them flexibility and trust that they're going to spend it in these areas. And as things change, we'll have to be updated and maybe change the MOU as we go along because the program might have to change 
And I think that we need to have some type of check and balance if that changes from what we see in front of us. Have another presentation and say, hey, I'm not saying come every month, but you know, we're getting a kind of a broad based thing on how they want to proceed right now. There's major changes in there because it's at the end of the summer, you know, there were significant savings, but we're seeing other significant costs. You know, I think that the central administration and, and the board should have to come forward and explain that and we might have to change the MOU to allow expending in certain other areas. It's something I think that we have to kind of, you know, in this partnership uh, while giving trust and giving, you know, not micromanaging it all the way down, do have to have kind of updates along the way uh, at certain points, at certain checkpoints, or as things majorly change and mm -hmm. the administration and the board figure out they need to go in a different direction or something else. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you. I'll go to Mr. Testani and then Ms. Charlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is Jack Testani. Mr. Cummings, I have a couple quick questions sort of along the lines of what Mr. Walsh was just sort of referring to, uh, but I'm just curious, in terms of this year, uh, with regard to the school year, now that we know it's closed, have there been any updated projections as to what was saved? So we have this document on extra expenses. Shouldn't we have additional savings that have been projected now that the school year has been confirmed as not coming back into session? Um. Well, the, what Ms. Munsell went over with you on Tuesday was the most recent information. I mean, that was information as of Monday. Um, so I, I'm sure we'll have more, but we don't have anything in the last two days. Okay. But there, you anticipate having more savings projected because the school year has been closed as of, I believe it was Monday, correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, I would expect that we would see some some additional savings. And the only other question I had was on the bus driving piece, since it's a big expenditure item, um, has the bus company uh, laid off their drivers? Uh, that's, I can't remember where I heard that oh, from, yeah. but I did hear that, and, that they, and they're collecting unemployment, but we're still paying the company, is that, did I hear that correctly? I, I don't have a first-hand knowledge of that. My understanding is, that when on March 13th, essentially, which was, you know, the first day out of school, um, and this is my understanding, the bus company laid off its employees on that day. Um, and I know that there's been conversation, and I don't believe they're the only bus company that did that. And I know there's been conversations about if we're going to be required to um, uphold some funding for them, is that funding going to the drivers themselves as it was intended to? Are you, do you know offhand if they're collecting unemployment and we're paying them? Or no. just, uh, I don't, I don't know, Mr. Titsani. I don't have knowledge of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just curious. That was what was yeah. there with, I heard. Okay. But hopefully we'll get a projection on, you're saying, separate from potential future savings, that $300,000 you and I talked about was potential savings from, the COVID related reimbursement on these additional expenses. That's what your yeah, the care care. calculation. So really we're looking at yeah. 1.5 million. Would that be fair to say? Um, yes, I, I suppose that's one way to look at it. If, if we were able to get, like you said, for example, the computers, the masks, that type of thing, that would, that would be uh, money that we eventually could get back. We, again, we just don't have a timeline on it. Okay. Just a quick uh, internet check. I found them for 61 cents a piece, just so you know. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Right. Thank you, Mr. Testani. Um, Ms. Charlton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Lori Charlton. Mr. Cummings. When I looked at the list, one of the things that struck me, uh, and I saw the cost there for the masks, is there any, uh, are there any other costs anticipated for um, 
cha either changes in, in the physical space or uh, cleaning arrangements or, or things like that. I, I keep hearing about um, different types of entities setting up spaces with, you know, extra hand washing stations and, you know, uh, places for, you know, people to use Purell or whatever. Yeah. And, and just sort of moving things around to accommodate the type of physical distancing that might not be necessary in the setup you have now. Um, I did hear you mention something about potential reimbursement, but you know, we don't know what we're going to get until we get it, obviously. So right. was that considered in this analysis? So, and, and what are your thoughts on what that might, might be? That, that's one of the things we've looked at. We didn't have a number on that to bring forward to you, you know, being conscious of the timeline. Um, there, Mr. Papa George has talked about the idea of relocating some of the uh, hand washing stations that already exist in the building, putting them closer to the entrances, closer to the offices, closer to the places where going in and out of the cafeteria, for example. Um, another thing that we, we just don't know about yet, but if you, if you see any of the pictures of um, students in uh, Asia, who've now returned to school, they've got these kind of plastic shields around their desks. You know, it's it's like a, a transparent um, three-piece uh, shield that's about a foot, two feet off the, the desk. I can't imagine that there's a tremendous expense for each of them, but when you add up the number of desks and spaces we'd have to do in the district. But again, we don't know yet. Um, we didn't feel comfortable putting some of those numbers down because we we don't know what the number would be, and nor do we know yet what some of those requirements are. Um, and that, I, 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 yeah, I guess I, my thought was that there, and you know, I appreciate what Mr. DeWitt said earlier that, you know, there, there may be just a, a, a physical limitation on how much we can accomplish in terms of remediation services and everything else, but this, there's also some risk here that there's some additional items that are not identified. That's right. Uh, they're not here because we don't know what they are right now. Yeah. So, okay. right. That's that's, that's that's yes. That's one of the things keeping everybody up. All right. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Mr. Matola. Then we're going to go to Ms. Kupchak. So it's John Matola again. So and maybe this and, and I'm asking this question because Mr. Cummings is here and. When we establish this um, non-lapsing account, and it, it kind of goes to what Mr. Walsh was saying too, we're going to put some money in that account. The, the question I have is, is it like when we appropriate money for the Board of Education that once we do that, that those funds are controlled by the Board of Education, or does the Board of Finance or the town in some fashion have any um, – control over how those funds are spent. I guess, and maybe this is something that legal's got to look into because uh, I'm not, I, if, if, if I'm looking at my figures from the discussion the other night, the Board of Ed can be, funds could be put into this non-lapsing account up to, I think it was $3.6 million. That's right. Something like that, right, Mr. Yeah, Cummings? Yeah. That's and correct. I believe, the percent of the budget. And I, and I believe your savings, because of the closure, are right around that figure, right? 3.3, .3, I think. Yeah, okay. 3.359, and, and, yeah. And so I, I think that's the question we're going to have to figure out. Do we put 3.3 .3 in, 3.6? Is there a thought that we're only going to put $1.8 million into this non-lapsing account? Um I just, you know, my druthers would be to put the 3.6 in, into that account or 3.3, but to, to what Mr. Walsh is saying, maybe it's a trust thing that they got to come back to us and say, this, you, we, you put this money in the account, we have control of it, um, and this is how we're spending it and the reasons why. And I see Mr. Walsh is raising his hand because he may have the answer to my question. So those are some of the concerns I have. Um, not concerned for questions. Who controls mm -hmm. the non-lapsing account? I know we set it up. I think we vote to put the money in there, but I think after that, it's the Board of Ed money. And, and uh, before I go to Mr. Walsh, I'll just add it, it. It depends on how we write up the MOU as well. 
Okay, and that's fine. So we we have to be we just have to be sure how we write off this MOU covers as many questions as we have, and knowing there'll be additional questions and concerns as we move forward. And then, as Mr. Walsh said, we'll have to retake a look at the MOU. And it also depends, I think, on how we want to manage the budget. So we that's the decisions that we have to make. Right. Is what are we going to do with the current budget? What do we want to do with the non-lapsing account? What does the MOU look like? And then we need to merge it, and we need to do most of this by Monday night. So those funds, if we only put 1.8 in and the Board of Ed has $3.6 million left over the, under, under the law, the, those monies would revert back to the town, the unspent monies. Um, I so, yeah, I, I know what you're saying, Mr. Brown. I, I, we got to figure some things out. Thank you. And, and I, I, I just want to add, we won't have everything figured out by Monday night. I know. I but know. we need to have um, at least a basic, more than a basic understanding of how we intend to move forward by Monday. So my, And then I'll, I'll shut up after oh. this. My concern is, as I said the other night, you know, the taxpayers already – spent this money. And the reason why there's $3.6 million left over is because the schools have been closed. And that money, in my opinion, needs to be used for educational purposes for the upcoming fiscal year. And I think the taxpayers would expect us to do that. So that's, that's my, we better not use that money to somehow reduce spending in, in, in some other department because that money has been targeted for education based on last year's budget or, the, or this year's budget. So that, that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Um, Mr. Walsh, you had a follow-up? Yeah, a follow-up on Mr. Matola. Um, these are kind of some of the questions I've been thinking about since our last meeting about how to do this and how to balance it how to cover some of the added expenses, which are, are totally um, coming out of left field, not only for the board of ed, but for the entire town. Um, and how to do that with covering the expenses at least they can identify now, and um, but also how to put an MLU together, but also how to take the taxpayer into account at the same time, because you're right, it is taxpayer money. Now, you know, I've asked myself, like, should we take the money back in to, you know, you know, when I'm questioning whether to set it up, and I've kind of gotten there, but when I first said, I'm like, why not just take the money in when they need it and come back? But on the other hand, I'm like, I don't really feel like micromanaging this and making them come back once a month with a set of invoices. Uh, so the way I've kind of, and I've talked to Mr. Brown about this a little bit, and I actually kind of ran the idea by Mr. Coming this afternoon would be if we funded the fall one point, it's almost one point nine million dollars. There's a pot of money that's left of about one point four. If, you know, if we put it, if we funded this account with the extra one point four, which we legally are allowed to do under the statute, what would happen if it wasn't spent? Could it sit there while people are doing emergency repairs for the next seven years? Well, I think our taxpayers kind of need some of that now. I mean, we need to put all of that money to use now, um, not seven years from now. Uh, so I, I was talking to Mr. Brown privately, and then I raised it on the phone with Mr. Cumming about how would they feel about maybe using like 1.9 to put in the fund specifically for these expenses or some other COVID expenses and some of the stuff didn't happen. And um, maybe using the other remaining balance, say that was 1.4 or whatever, um, towards the operational budget that we're looking at right now for next year. If we were able to do that, then we could reduce their budget, but it would really be a, you know, it would really be a wash 
we'd be specifically putting money in to apply towards next year's budget that they would have access to as long as I'm not sure how long it's going to take to figure out exactly how much money is in there, whether we have to wait till September because of the fact that we don't have the final numbers worked out. It takes literally until, even though the, the tax year ends or the municipal year ends on June 30th, it's not to our September meeting where we finally get the full final invoices are in, numbers are done, know how much that is. But obviously, my thought would be they could use that towards their operational budget as soon as we worked out what that would be. Um, this way, it's a balancing. We are giving um, the education system the money that they are um, needing for at least some these COVID expenses that have been identified. And we would be at least being able to reduce their budget by that amount, but knowing that we're, we're gonna put that money in to their operational budget if we reduce it. So I'm kind of putting that out there as a discussion point, not, you know, I've, I've thought about it. It's out to me, it makes sense after thinking about it for a while. Um, Mr. Cummings, you can address that. But and Ms. Vitale, I've been talking to Mr. Cummings. Uh, he said that there might've been some discussion about that internally, but whatever. So I, I don't know, but let's put it out there. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Um, what, I'll come back to Mr. Cummings or Ms. Vitale if you want to address Mr. Walsh's comment, but I do want to go to Ms. Kupchak. She's been waiting patiently. Ms. Kupchak? I just wanted to mention when you were discussing COVID-related uh, related expenses earlier, we have each of our departments submitting those expenses to our finance department, as well as the Board of Ed is uh, submitting invoicing to us to keep a file for, which we intend to submit and receive some reimbursement on. So I just wanted to say that earlier when you were talking about that. Thank you, Ms. Kupchak. Um, does anyone want to address Mr. Walsh's comments? I don't know if Ms. Vitale does. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I can't speak for the full board, but I I appreciate that intent, and you know we appreciate the position that you're in and the position the taxpayer is in. We're all taxpayers; many of our teachers are taxpayers, and I think that um, you know if we could set up an MOU to be structured that way for these funds to help buffer a reduction to our proposed budget, I think that the board would be amenable to that especially since our budget, Board of Ed approved budget has already been reduced at the first selectman's level. So we're already looking at a reduction. Um, I know that part of that reduction is hopefully gonna be covered. You know, it's gonna be a wash because we'll see some savings in health insurance. But as Ms. Munsell shared earlier in the week that, um, you know, th that could be variable also. So I, I appreciate, as I said last week in our past meetings, the intent of trying to set up this account and working together to, to preserve the school district that, you know, we've all invested a lot of time, energy, and money in to, and is one of our town's greatest assets. Thank you, Mr. Talley. Um, Question? Mr. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I wanna to go to Mr. Bateson and then Ms. Charlton. Ed? Hey, Jim, how are you? I apologize for jumping on the meeting late, and I don't want to be, uh, I, I don't want to ask a question twice, but I want to follow up on what uh, Mr. Testani was talking about with transportation, and I want to direct this to Mike Cummings. Um, given what Jack had just mentioned, talking about the cancellation of the school year and the bus contract, uh, the first student contract, uh, it's something around $9 million, and I think what we're losing is basically one marking period. So I'd say, you know, a quarter of the contract. Uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, what I remember under Lamont's EO was that we had to keep the bus drivers on payroll just in case school came back. Well, now I, I just want to make sure that the BOE or, you know, you guys are talking to other school districts and make sure that now that the whole situation has changed and I'm seeing several million dollars in flux here. If, you know, the bus drivers have been put on unemployment you know, there's a strong case to be made against for a student. 
about you know what we're paying for. I just want to make sure that you know this might affect the dollars that are falling into the MOU. I want to make sure. I mean, this is not you know I see the savings here in uh, Doreen's spreadsheet, and it's you know several hundred thousand. But you know, in, the, in my head, I'm thinking there's a couple million in play here. So, if you guys could just make sure, talk to other districts, talk to council, make sure that you know. <laughs> There's not more money out there for us to, to be had. So that's my comment on that. Thank you. Understood. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Bateson. Uh, Ms. Charlton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Laurie Charlton. I just want to address Mr. Walsh's comment from earlier and the approach that he described. I'm very much in agreement with that. Um, we have some level of unknown expenses to, to cover related issues. Um, we don't know what those are going to be. With regard to the remaining money that is uh, that was quote unquote saved, and I don't know if it's 3.5 million because I, as I recall, uh, 600,000 of that or so was really a deferral of expenses uh, that's going to move into the future. But regardless, the remaining amount. Um, I also agree with Mr. Matola's point that was taxpayer money that was designated for education this year. To the extent that's applied to the operational budget next year to reduce and sort of hold harmless from, from any cut, I think that's um, the ideal way to handle this. It helps us out of a little bit of a pinch in a difficult budget year, um, but it doesn't affect the students and I, you know, I don't have I don't have children in the school district. Um, I do have a seven year old grandchild. I see the effect of distance learning on little ones, and it's deeply concerning. Um, you know, I, I think the teachers, the administrators, have a massive job on their hands. No one knows what this is going to look like. We appreciate what they're doing. Uh, this could have a you know an effect on all the students in the district that is is not going to turn around overnight. So. You know, I am fully supportive of having whatever savings came from this year be allocated toward the operational budget uh, for next year to, at a minimum, fully offset any, uh, you know, any budget reductions that are taken. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Charleston. Yep, thank you. I want to go over to our town attorney, Mr. Baldwin, who um, has a comment on the bus contract. Mr. Baldwin? The, the executive order 7R says required that the bus companies continue to pay uh, their active employees. And there was contemplation that they keep a certain number of active employees at the ready should uh, school resume. But now that we know that school is not resuming, it is kind of the general understanding that all those bus drivers or the the vast majority have been laid off. And Executive Order uh, 7R goes on to state that those bus companies and the municipalities or the Board of Ed must negotiate in good faith and the bus companies should return the lion's share of their savings from not paying those employees back to the municipalities. And, and now that that just happened this week, obviously that's a discussion that should happen uh, in the immediate future. Hey, thank you, Mr. Baldwin. Just on that specific item, does anyone have any follow-up questions for Mr. Baldwin? Mr. Walsh? Do we have, does the district have any idea approximately what that would be now that we can start talking to the bus companies about that, what those additional savings would be? That's to you, Mr. Baldwin, or Mr. Baldwin, or Mr. Cummings, or whoever's. Yeah, I, 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 I'm not in a position to say what those savings are. Certainly at this point, um, but those discussions uh, were begun before the school year was canceled outright, and I'm sure that they'll continue. But I can't, I can't speak for the um, the board or the administration. 
Mr. Cummings? Yes, I'd have to get that number for you. I, I don't have it with me, and Ms. Munsell and Ms. DC have been involved with those conversations, so I have to get that for you. I'll ask for that tonight. Okay. Well, Mr. Cummings, do you think that's a number like we'll have like tomorrow? I'm going to shoot for it, yes. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Tistani, did you have a question? Uh, no, thanks, Mr. Chair. Mr. Walsh just asked it. Thank you. Okay, any further questions, comments for the Board of Ed? Um, Mr. Walsh? This, this is kind of more of a comment, just thinking about this MOU. So, I mean, I think that at some point, if we're really going to do this the right way, there should be some, if there's money left at the end, there, we should talk at some point about how much are we going to leave in this fund to pay for the emergency repairs, which is kind of, I know we have so much to deal with, but at the end, that's the reason why people have these funds is to pay for like emergency repairs. So, and at some point when this whole COVID thing is over, you know, we should probably talk whether that should be like $500,000, $750,000 or, or whatever that's going to be so that when the board of that goes forward. If there's money at the end of the year, we fund it up to a certain amount. But I don't think, as well as the law allows us to keep 2%, that's almost like $3.6 million. It doesn't make sense to have $3.6 million in that account. And the MOUs I've seen that are out there for this are approximately $500,000. Now, they might be for smaller districts. I understand that. I'm not saying it should definitely be $500,000 for our district. But I talked to Mr. Cummings about that a little bit. This should be for emergency repairs. This shouldn't be, oh, this, you know, this, this formula is going. Let's not put it in the budget this year because we'll just use the money out of that account. They should be truly emergency monies. We also talked about things such as maybe there should be a, a way for them to appeal to the Board of Finance on a specific project. Maybe it's a move for some reason or something that they could go into that account, but they would have to come to us. On, on those specific things. But these are things I think we should consider putting into the MOU. And then the last thing I wanted to say was that if for some reason there was a windfall in money that came from the federal government or state government or however we got it to pay for school expenses that we are using the money for, you know, maybe since if we if we paid them that the town would get reimbursement for that, that that just wouldn't sit there or they'd be able to get to use on top of everything else, unless they needed it. Unless yeah, you know, there's got to be some flexibility. In it. But um, you know, if we got like we qualified for 1.5 million dollars and we had paid most of the expenses, well, we should be able to get that money back as opposed to it just sitting in this account. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Thank you. Yeah. I'm 100% agree, and again, we won't have everything settled by Monday, but if we can have a, just a sense of understanding, you know, we're well on our way. And I think uh, Mr. DeWitt had, has talked, well, I know Mr. DeWitt has talked to Mr. Baldwin about the non-lapsing account and the MOU, so there is a first draft out there, and we'll continue to work on it. Okay, thank you. Any, Mr. Walsh? If that draft could be like circulated for ideas from the rest of our board, I think that would be great. No, that, that is definitely yeah. the intent. The, the okay. draft that I'm, I'm speaking of was, is about two hours old. Oh, okay. And, yeah, so it's nothing, and, it, it, and Mr. DeWitt had his conversation with Mr. Baldwin, I believe, was it yesterday, Mr. DeWitt? Yes, yesterday. So it's it right after our previous meeting on Tuesday. And this whole board, our whole board, and I'm sure the Board of Ed will will be taking a look at these drafts before anything is finalized. Okay, any further questions? Ms. Vitale, you had a comment? 
just thank you. Um, the board that has a meeting on Tuesday. The board of the finance committee also has a committee meeting on Tuesday morning. That is on the finance committee's agenda just to get some feedback from the board of education on this MOU also and to follow up from our conversation tonight. And again, I just want to um, thank the board of finance for, for your openness um, in discussing this and for the, the conversations that were had um, between the superintendent and with myself. Um, it's really a joy, maybe the wrong word, but um, it's definitely been um, refreshing to move forward in such a collaborative way. So again, thank you. And with that, I'm gonna go back to mute. Thank you, Mr. Talley. Yep, and we'll continue on that track. Um, any further questions, comments? Of course, okay, seeing none, I'm gonna let the Board of Ed go and uh, have a good rest of your night. And we'll, well, Mr. Matola, you had a question before I let him go? I was just waving goodbye. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right. <laughs> good night to the Board of Ed. Good night. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay. I'm still on the same item, public executive session, budget deliberations. We're going to go over to the town. Um, we have Ms. Bossy, Ms. Kupchak, Mr. Bremer, and Ms. Gardner with us. And we received some updated documents from our finance department uh, this afternoon. And the first cover page is titled Suggested COVID Adjustments to FY21 Board of Selectmen Budget. So who am I going to turn it over to in the finance department? And what would you like to review at this point? Um, so, Mr. Brown, um, as we spoke about yesterday, most of this is some uh, the COVID adjustments that we gave to everyone a while back. But when I was meeting with the finance department, I thought it might be helpful if we sort of broke it out in a more um, to understand uh, format some of the uh, memos just briefly. So the first packet are just um, talking about the adjustments and changes to bring the tax down, the tax rate from our original 2.46 Board of Selectmen budget and then the 2.16 what we offered in COVID related reductions. So then we talked about it further and we looked at um, the OPEB and debt service. So we broke out. So uh, Ms. Kupchak, Ms. Kupchak, I, I don't mean to I don't mean to cut you off, but can you just tell us what we should be looking at? Oh, so the the documents that you just referred to? Right, but there's three of them. So I just want to know which summary page would you like us to go to? Um, the one that says summary, page one. Okay, so the one that says summary page one and budget after COVID adjustments. Okay, adjustments. So the first line is adjustment for collection rate from 98.83 to 98.62. That page? Correct. Okay, thank you. Correct. Yeah. So we were uh, working on this and so we, we were coming up some assumptions and changes to bring down the um, the original 2.46 that we had reduced to 2.16 and we looked at 2 million out of OPEB and a million out of debt service. That's the third page. They're on the first page. Well, that's the third page. But so the bottom line is this is the things we were looking at making changes to bring down the tax rate. And that would bring it down to 1.16. And then I thought we would have further discussions regarding, you know, we put in the second page of that document, summary page two, just some ideas, um, just to give you a sense of what our increase was after we made our COVID adjustments. And it was 500, Linda, $548,000 above last year's. So that was the only increase to our town side budget. And then we uh, 
We broke out what those are. At the bottom, if you see in the gray box, those were our costs um, for the, well, you see the total 524.99. Okay, right on page two, on summary page two. Correct. So what you're, what you're saying is the, these new initiatives are part of the town increase. Right. After we it, did the COVID, we were at, so we were originally at 2.46, we went down to 2.16. And then we, that is really a, the only addition to our budget is $548,000. And we wanted to break that out for you so you could see it um, in gray. And that would be the increase, and there, those are things that, you know, obviously you can discuss and, um, and, and think about how you want to manage those and what you want to do with them. And then on the Great, third page, we, we looked at, you know, like, again, the, the OPEB, $2 million, debt service, $1 million. And then options, obviously, I think the only real options after the, you know, looking at the gray box, to, depending on what you guys want to do with those, to what the cost, what the amount you would have to cut to get yourself, to get our town uh, down even further to percentage-wise tax increases. And the only things, I mean, the only things I can see are, are use of the fund balance and whatever the Board of Ed, if there's a reduction to the Board of Ed, brings you, gives you an idea where you would be. So a 0.6 million would bring you down below 1% tax increase. $1.3 million, uh, million dollar reduction brings you to a 0.7% to 0.76%. 7, 2 million, 0.49, 2.7 million, you're at 2.26. And an additional 3.5 million would bring it to a zero. Hey, thank you, Ms. Kupchak. Uh, Ms. Charlton, and then Mr. Matola. Ms. Charlton? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question for, um, for Brenda or for Caitlin. Can you, uh, I, I apologize if we talked about this earlier. I don't recall we did. What, what is the million dollars in reduction in debt service attributable to? No, that was a recommendation, a suggestion. There was 1.4 million in the debt service account. That you, uh, the Board of Finance, transferred 400,000 out for fill pile last meeting. There's a million dollars left in that. Oh, I see. Okay. Reduction in our debt service. No, I'm saying you could you could use that Got money to lower the tax rate. Further. I understand what it is. Okay, so that's uh, that was the what was originally set aside last year for fill pile expenses that we have not yet um, sort of reauthorized, if you will. Well, that's not that's not Caitlin. Go ahead. That was not the fill pile money. The fill pile money was the million eight. And that was already moved over, and then there was a two point seven from uh, that we moved over to debt service for tax stabilization purposes. So we moved, so we used 1.3 in the current budget already in debt service. We transferred over the 400 recently to the fill pile that left a million. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. I, I thought 1.4 somehow I had that in my head that that was available for the fill pile, but I got it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Charlton. But you, yes, it's on the right track. It's money that we could have used for the fill pile and we transferred 400 for that purpose. We would have transferred everything if Mr. Carey had come before us and, and said that he absolutely needed it. Uh, but he came forth and said he only needed 400,000 of that 1.4. So now we have a million left and it's, it's, it, it could be used um, to reduce debt service by a million dollars. And Ben, and I'm sorry, Lori Charlton again, but that, Obviously, the the four hundred thousand that we did allocate toward the fill pile is only to cover 
known remediation expenses. It doesn't do anything for the big fill pile. So effectively, I guess you could just consider this other million as, as normal fund balance in a sense. Um, and, and this suggestion would be to apply that toward, um, toward the mill rate for 2021. So I got, I got right. it. Thank you again. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Charlton. Mr. Matola. I think I think my questions were, were answered just so I understand. You would use that $1 million to re reduce what we were going to pay this upcoming fiscal year for debt service and just take this amount and use it for that. That's it, yes. right? Yeah. Yep. Okay. I, I get it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Um, um, Mr. Walsh, and then Mr. Tistani. Um, on page two, what is this partial explanation of town increases? Are you saying to keep all these new initiatives or get no, rid I of them? Break, I was breaking out because I noticed when we were going through the documents in our meeting, you know, when you look at the other documents, I mean, they're very small, but it's kind of hard to even understand it as a regular human being. You know, just looking at it, you can't really... You know, there's no explanation and there's acronyms, and I thought it would be easier to show that the town increase after we offered the COVID-related um, adjustment, that it would be easier for everyone to just see exactly that the only increase in our budget that we're offering after our COVID-related adjustments was $548,000. And then I wanted you all to see what that 540, well, basically what that 500 and change is, and that's in the gray. So you want to still increase the town positions by what your initiatives were, and you no, want to increase the number? No, I'm giving the document for you to understand what our increases were after we gave the COVID adjustment. Okay. So that, that way you could see each one, how much what each cost, and then you can make decisions on how you want to move forward so you could see them line by line and the costs associated with each. Okay. Because it's much Ms. easier to see it like that than it is to see it in these other ones where they're, you know, just not really clear in these other documents. Okay. But are you, what is your recommendation, Ms. Kupchik, to cut these positions or to, or to spend the money on them? Well, I've said this in past meetings. Um, that I uh, that I think we definitely need our grant writer. Listen, if we are in a normal circumstance, and I've said this repeatedly over the, I don't know, 10 meetings I've gone to with you guys, um, that I, I think that we sh it would be great to have an economic development person who would be an economic recovery person who could help our business community dig out of the hole. But again, that's up to, that's up to the Board of Finance. I personally think they would be beneficial to help our business community who's in, a, who's in a lot of trouble right now. And we're, we're meeting with them regularly. The school nurse, I, I just, I think that's something you can't really cut. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think the grant writer will more than pay for themselves um, in helping us uh, apply for disaster relief, which there's going to be a lot of that. So, um, but okay. if you want to do, and also the fire marshal, yep. you know, that's something that's going to help us, you know, with our, with our building codes and our, our revenues, because they do bring revenue. So building brings in revenue, um, recreation brings in revenue, and the town clerk brings in revenue, and actually the fire marshal uh, department brings in revenue to the town. So these are just things that you could look at um, as far as what you'd like to do. I mean, out of the entire amount we've got going, and it's not, I just wanted to outline that this is $524,000, not millions and millions and millions of dollars. Okay, I, I, I guess, so you're recommending that those positions stay in the budget? I'm saying that I want to- I keep asking you the same question. I'm just asking for a yes or no answer. Uh, I, listen, I get it. If you want to, if you, if you, if I could pick any one out of these, I would cut the business person, the economic development person. So that's the only one you're recommending that we should cut? Well, I think, listen, I know that you could cut, potentially cut the blight inspector, but I think that he really helps keep our building department generating 
more inspections when he takes that load off the inspectors. So I don't know. I mean, does, will he help? Would this light inspector person help our help our building department inspectors be able to do more inspections and help us bring in more revenue to the town potentially? So that's a, that's a tricky one. Um, the grant writer, obviously, I think that's a no-brainer. Um, and I don't think you can touch the school nurse. I mean, the, the need was outlined um, very clearly by the health department that there's a need there. Okay, but it's not on your recommended list. My recommended list is to take two million out of OCAP and a million out of debt service. That brings you, it brings the board to a 1.16% tax increase. How my my next sheet was showing that to me to get you down to the lower, you got to look at. You could the only places I see you could look at are either fund balance or in a board of ed reduction based on savings to get get okay. you down to anything lower than that. 0 0.97, 0 0.76, 0 0.49, 0 0.26. Okay. But since Those it's not on your recommended list, I don't see you recommending that we should cut any of your new initiatives and that we should add these new employees. Well, I cut quite a bit when I offered the COVID document. We cut police cars. We cut a lot of different things. But you want to add these five new employees? I, I'm sorry. Did you not hear what I just said? You cut police cars. I heard you say you cut police cars. Are you saying, I said, yes, I would love to have all these employees because I think some of them are going to generate income. If I, I would say that you should, I went through it, I'll go through it again. The economic development person, you could cut them. I think the fire marshal helps us raise revenue. I think you can't cut the Stratfield nurse. And I think the blight inspector may allow us to perform more inspections to generate more income in building permit fee, and the grant writer will help us save money with disaster relief. Okay. So a lot of these are actually, in my opinion, gen revenue generating um, positions. Okay. If we follow you down your rabbit's hole with this OPEB cut of $2 million, it's going to cause the OPEB number to increase next year and are you making a commitment to fully fund that next year in your next budget well I'm not sure what other options this is some options that members of the Board of Finance suggested to me that that you were looking at well are these yours or are these the board of members board of finance members you've been speaking to I have discussions with all of you. We're all in this together. It's not me and you. It's all of us. We're Team Fairfield, remember? No, I understand. I haven't had any discussions with you about it. Well, these are these are discussions that we had when H&H um, &H was here and Mr. Behe was here about the right. first pension. I mean, I'm assuming we would spread it out over the years, Mr. Walsh, to lower the impact on the taxpayers. No, I know, but the problem is, is I guess the question is, is are we going to fully fund whatever the PDAC is next year? I think we have to spread it out. I mean, just like you were mentioning earlier with the Board of Ed, you know, you're talking about emergency funds and things of that nature. I mean, the taxpayers have been putting into our, to our fund balance for many, many years instead of enjoying a lower tax rate over the years. Um, I mean, it's an emergency. We're in an emergency. I don't know any other emergency that's ever been quite like this. Are you still suggesting that we should bond $3 million to help pay for this budget? Yes. I mean, after talk, listen, I mean, I only got here six months ago, but I've had many discussions with our financial people we pay quite a bit of money to <laughs> um, to help us. And they've said over and over we could bond $100 million dollars. And, 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 and not be in any danger of jeopardizing anything. I don't think $3 million is a huge amount to take the pressure off the, the budget this year so we could offer our taxpayers a, a, a lower... Well, we tax. also... Okay. 
I also think we went through a number of scenarios where we are going to be getting close to bonding $100 million of things we know that are on the agenda, such as the renovation of our WPCA plant that we have coming up. Um, we have um, a fill pile issue, which could cost millions. I mean, we don't know what that's going to be. We have other things on the waterfall chart that if we add this on, is going to basically push school school projects out. And that's kind of my concern about it, is adding, keep adding on bonding. I know we can borrow that amount, but we also have a lot of projects on our waterfall chart that we know we will be bonding for. Um, Mr. Walsh, anything else right now? Thank you. All right. I just want to go back before I go to another board member, uh, back to the new initiatives and the new hires. So, Ms. Kubchak, what I don't see on here, unless I'm missing it, is the Park and Rec Service Coordinator, right? Because that budget went from 75000 to 138 from one I person to Anthony could speak to that, but I believe that was going to be, that's a part-time going to a full-time, and it was supposed to be funded through recreation program. And, and, and other offsets. Oh, and, and other offsets. Go ahead, neutral. speak to it. Right, speak to it. Uh, the rec coordinator um, actually generated uh, a net positive to the budget uh, because there were offsets in seasonal and part-time that were greater than the cost of the new employee. So if you cut that employee, you will actually be increasing the budget. And it, it shows there's six approved employees in fiscal year 20, and in 21, there's seven. So we're adding an employee, correct? That's correct. Explain. Yeah. I, I, I'm not sure of your numbers. Just repeat that again, please. On fiscal year 20, uh, Parks and Recs has full-time, current, six employees. For the fiscal year 21 request, full-time, the request is for seven. And That's it goes, correct. the total goes from 486 to 568. So we're adding an employee in this budget, correct? That's correct. Your, your offsets are, for, for the recreation person, let me just look. Um, yeah, your offsets, hold on, this is so small, I'm sorry, are in, yeah, that, that one, that one's back, thank you, that's a larger one. Okay, your offsets are in Penfield part-time, waterfront seasonal, and an increase in two revenue accounts. But even with the revenue accounts set aside, your offsets in expenses in Penfield and Waterfront exceed the cost of the new employee and all their benefits. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Ms. Charlton. Yes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a question. I, I, I don't, maybe this is on the other document, but it, on that second page, where we say that the increase on the town side is 548,000. Um, I mean, it's really not 548,000, is it? Because we've, part of the reductions was bonding of paving and a bunch of capital. So if you think about the spending, the spending is increased. You really have to take that into account. So it's really, you know, three and a half million or 3.6 million or something. Is that, I mean, I, I think it yeah, was about I mean, this. Obviously, there's a lot of adjustments made. I mean, we put the we put stuff in the bonding to bring down the tax rate. Absolutely. Well, I, I know. Yeah, I hear that. But I mean, we're reconciling to this change, which excludes the bonding. So there's. I guess my point was that 548,000 is that's not the, that's not the true increase. If you wanted to get to the true increase, you'd have to sort of add back the spending that's just shifting from operational to bonding, right? And right. then I mean, we we're, we're we're increase. Yeah. yeah, okay. I, mean, I just, 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 I just
but I mean, the bottom line is we were at 2.46. We offered adjustments to bring us to 2.16, and now we're offering some other suggestions to bring us to 1.16. Yeah, I got it. it. Oh, it's the measure of a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of tools in that toolbox. You know, it's not all cutting. It's cutting. No, it's I, I understand. understand. Yeah, no, I understand. I just, we're reconciling to this number that we're saying is the increase. And I, that what's throwing me off is that these, these so initiatives happen to equate to that increase. But the increase is actually, if, if you took into account the things that were just moving to bonding, there's there's a bunch of other stuff in there, and that maybe that's why we can't quite get to it. So I I wanted to clarify that for everybody, but that was it. Thank you. Yeah, Lori, I'd like to clarify the term you use. We didn't. This is not a reconciliation, because what you're doing, what the other adjustments are, they're ins and outs. There's increases and decreases. That's why the title says a partial explanation, because you have. Increase in regular payroll, you have decrease in paving for whatever reasons. So this gray box is not a reconciliation. The main point here was to show you after the COVID adjustments, the Board of, it, a board of Ed increases 5.6 million, the town increases 500,000, that's all. And we were just trying to give you an idea of what was left. To, no, to, I, to, I I appreciate that. I, reconciliation. I, I hear you. I just, I'm not sure, and, I, and I'll let it go. I'm just not sure it's a fair analysis to say the Board of Ed increased 5.6 million and the town increased 5.4 because the Board of Ed doesn't have that same benefit in the 5.6 of having moved several million dollars to bonding, right? So it's, and I'm not, uh, that's, that's my only point. As we, as we look at the numbers, I get, I appreciate the, the analysis on the bottom, I think that's helpful. It summarizes the new initiatives. Um, it highlights what we're kind of left with here that's not included in your COVID adjustments. I get that. I just, um, when I first looked at this, it struck me because the 548,000 is, at least in the way I think of it, and maybe I'm thinking about it differently, but it's, it's actually a much larger number. So thank you again. Thank you, Ms. Charlton. Uh, Mr. Testani. Yes, thanks, Mr. Chair, Jack Castani. Uh, just a quick question, and it may be just it's a, a very small number, but I, I, I just curious. There's about a twenty something, twenty three thousand seven hundred eighty two dollar difference between the partial explanation and what's on the sheet. I just curious what that represents. So, in your summary, the partial explanation, it's five twenty four nine ninety. And on the right. town sheet, I mean, 548.7072. So there's a gap there of 23,782. I'm just curious what that differential right. for. Again, that wasn't a reconciliation. That was just explaining the bulwark of the increase. And, and it's not even explaining the bulwark of the increase because you have ins and outs of greater magnitude that are reflected in the COVID adjustments. We were just trying to give you an idea, of, no, I, a, par I'm a partial that. idea. There are other small incidental items. Yes, there are increases, you know, right. you know uh, numerous, Linda, yeah. No, Linda, I understand, I appreciate it. I just, really, I just happened to notice there was a difference in yeah. those figures. I just wondered, yeah. If there was an explanation for it, that's all. Um, yeah. The, the other piece I was curious about was you have a $91,000 assessment for the incremental rebound that I I know is coming up this year. I just, where did that number come from? Is that something we had been advised on? The town has been advised on. I just curious how we came up with $91,000. That, that's in the assessor's department budget under fees and professional services. Okay. Gotcha. It You're increased right. from the 20 yep. budget by 91000 Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Testani. Mr. Walsh? So getting back to Ms. Charlton's point, I guess she's right. So, you know, since we have all this borrowing capacity, we could basically just borrow the $6.2 million and have a 0% tax increase, right?
I, I have no idea, Mr. Walsh. I, I guess, I, I, well, I'm, well, we bought the 6.6. I'm, I'm not a financial wizard. I'm just trying to give suggestions to the Board of Finance of ideas to try to lower the tax increase on the residents of Fairfield. I, I understand that. We're all trying to do that. And some well, of the really ideas we've we talked call, about. We work together in an effort to do that in a, in a congenial and collaborative way. Okay, any further questions on this document? Okay, let's put this to the side and it looks like we have, um, and we've gone through this more than a few times, but we have Mr. Conley with us. We have Mr. Calabrese with us, and it looks like we have Ms. Brown with us. And most likely they would be here to address any further questions that we might have on the revenue. Mr. Matola. And thank you for being here, by the way. Mr. Conley, I, 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 Mr. Calabrese, and Ms. I, Brown. Go, go ahead, Mr. Matola. I guess just to cut to the chase, has anything changed in this in these documents since the last time we were all together? That's that's all I would ask. It seemed like they're all the same pretty much, right guys? Are we in agreement with that? Yes, the document is the same. Okay. Then I Meaning no changes. Questions. Okay. Thank you. So are there any questions? So if there aren't any, any, any um, questions in regards to what, Mr. Brown? Just the revenue. Just any questions for Ms. Brown, Mr. Conley, or Mr. Calabrese on the revenue? I don't have any. I think they've been very good in coming back and explaining at the last meeting, personally. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. Okay. So any no questions on these two financial documents, um, Mr. Mertola? I'm sorry. Um, I, I think just to Anthony, it's my understanding that the, that camps with certain rules and restrictions have been given the okay to open up this summer. Is that correct? Summer camps with um, very, very rigid restrictions have been uh, given so far to open up as of June 29th. We're expecting some more guidance by May 15th from uh, the state. Okay, and you still intend to run the summer program? That's the intent? We still intend to run a summer program. Um, what it will look like is still anybody's guess, but I, I hope to get something out to the parents next week. All right, th thank you. That's all I wanted to explore. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Sorry I didn't ask that earlier. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matola. Seeing that there's no further questions on revenue, uh, Mr. Bateson. Uh, sorry, Jim. Hey, sorry, Jim. My question was on the previous document. Sorry, I was a little slow. Oh, okay. 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 Did I miss you? Did I miss you? All right. All right. But before we go before back we to that, back to so that, we can let Ms. 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 Brown and Brown Mr. Calabrese and Mr. Conley go, are there any questions on this current document that we're looking at for revenue? I'm seeing none. And so I'm going to say good night to those three, and thank you for being here for Just In Case. Good night. Thank you very much. Okay, Mr. Basin, what would you like to look at? It's taken me a couple. Uh, this this is the first time I saw this document, the one we were just talking about COVID with the uh, OPEB and whatnot on there. Uh, I, I guess this question is to Brenda. This $2 million OPEB, is that net of what I anticipate the Joint Retirement Board is going to do on Monday about the mortality rate? So no, it, it looks like you want to reduce that two million, but it looks like they're going to be. Ed, Ed, yes. this is retiree. Ed, this is retiree health benefits. This is not pension. Yeah, it's not pension. Yeah, it's not pension. Okay. Yeah, it's not pension. Okay, so we're leaving. So that you, we're still. The administration's position is 
that mortality rate is we're not you're not doing that anything for this year. Well, that's a different. That's so. All right, two things. So we talked to Matt. 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 Morello, Sperndo. Sperndo, who had said uh, we were well, very well, we were very healthily funded in the uh, retiree health benefit account, and that there was, you know, there, you know, there, it wasn't a jeopardy to take something from there. He, ne he said, never take any money from your pension um, uh, contributions. That would be bad. So, obviously, do not do that. Um, as far as this whole mortality rate thing, I mean, listen, I don't completely even understand this. Uh, I, I mean, this came up, like, out of, like, blindside, and I can't, still don't understand if 50% of the towns have not adopted it yet, and 50% have, why it is so like hair on fire we have to adopt it this year and why we couldn't wait for one year. And that's kind of the argument I'd like to make to the pension board Monday. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like this is something we need to do this year or we're putting our uh, pension um, uh, beneficiaries in, in any kind of jeopardy and then we could adopt it next year when we're building the budget in the fall instead of at the end of the budget cycle, but rather in the beginning so that we could actually make plans to incorporate it, whether it be all together or in a phased-in approach. So that's what I would think, but, maybe, you know, I'm not, on the, I'm not a pension financial person, but it seems to me if 50% of the towns aren't doing it and 50% are, I just thought we could at least, obviously, during a pandemic when we don't have, when we're having a real problem here with financials, um, it would be a it would be a tough situation to take it on. So that's that's all about that, uh, Ed, about the pension piece. All right. I just I, I want to follow up with Linda. Is Linda there? I thought I heard her voice. Yeah. Be here. Be here. All right. Just, just a quick thing. I, I heard you saying, yeah, the mortality rate has to do with the pension. But what I'm thinking is. To me, these are just journal entries. I, I, you know, you're recommending a certain amount that we fund OPEB and a certain amount we fund uh, the pension. Now, the administration's coming out and saying, well, we could do without $2 million in OPEB. The, but then I have, uh, let's say, the JRIB on Monday night says we need an additional 1.8 for mortality. So what I'm looking at is journal entries here. Okay, well, I take the $2 million that the administration's recommending, and put that into pension. You see what I'm saying? I, I don't want to, even though these aren't related, they are when it comes to the dollars that I'm funding. So I, I want to be clear that if there's a path here or somebody's thinking that there's money to be saved or where we can, you know, under budget, I get it. I just want to make sure that, you know, there's, if we're going down this, like Wall said, rabbit hole, there's other options. I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Okay, we'll continue with the risk with the risk of having this whole conversation all over again. And I just want to be real careful of that. Um, Mr. Walsh was next, and then Ms. Charlton, and then Mr. DeWitt. I believe you have your hand up. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Walsh? Yeah. If the pension board does what they seem to tell us that they were going to do and adopt these new municipal mortality rates, we're in a really difficult position. I mean, we that mortality rate's gonna have an effect. We're down at $40 million in market value with our investments. And we just took a $16 million hit on one of our investments with this Allianz screw up. $16 million that the public doesn't even know about. That it is going to be, you heard what the guy said, we are now going to be at around 75% funded. And I would like to have Mr. Sperndell appear before we vote, because I want to hear him talk about the 75%, because it sounds like he doesn't seem to have a problem with it. But I would like to hear him say that live on behalf of his firm to us, because we also heard H&H &H say that AAAs are not supposed to be under 80% funded. 
So if we can have him here Monday to start the month, I mean Tuesday, excuse me. Okay. We can do that. What we also have to follow is what the pension board actually does. And that, we vote, the 11th is Monday, by the way. We vote yep. on Monday night. Okay. The pension board meets Monday at 4. And we vote and start the vote Monday at 7.30. Yeah. Now, we I can't be, night. Yes. So I can't be on that call at 4 o'clock on Monday. I have another meeting I have to attend. And we need to, it needs to get back to us on what happened at that pension. How did they vote? What did they say? And so someone should report that to us on uh, Monday evening at 7.30. So, Mr. Brown, well, if you want, I'm more than happy to have um, Matt, because uh, I didn't hear that of, at uh, whatever night were we here, Tuesday night. I didn't hear the pension board say they were 75. I thought they said they were at 84. But I'm no, happy but, to have them write, um, write an email uh, to Caitlin that she can share with all of you about where we are so you could have that um, yes. tomorrow. I know that Caitlin said today that Matt had a, an accident. He was hit by a car. He was riding his bike. Um, but we could get that information so you could have it in writing so you at least um, can have whatever uh, they said. Because I, I don't know that, but, but just to get clarification from Hooker and Holcomb, you know, in writing to all of you would probably be best thing, just so you could have that. Okay. Now, let's just clarify. We know where we are at now under the table that we have been using, which is 86%. If, okay. if we went with the new mortality table oh, right, right. and put in the $1.8 million, we would be at 83%. Mm -hmm. okay. If, okay, this year. Now, if we do not, and with what has happened to the market, in recent weeks, plus with Allianz, we have the potential to be under 80%. And that's really what Mr. Walsh's question refers to. And okay. it's also, he also stated that municipalities that ha are triple A's are not under 80%. Okay. So the risk is if we go below 70, 80%, it's one variable, but it's one important variable, just like the fund balance is very important. Um, if we lose, if we go below 80, it could potentially put us at risk. So Mr. Walsh wants clarification that if we do go under 80 and we don't fund this, is there a risk of, of losing our AAA or at least, you know, being at risk of that um, at that point? But what I'd like to know before we vote is what, you know, Mr. Vahey really was talking for Mr. Vahey for the most part, because there wasn't a vote. We need to see the vote. We need to see the outcome of that vote Monday. But he was very clear that the intent of the pension board was to use that new table. Right, but did he say that meeting about phasing in the uh, costs, phasing in the associated costs? that that was now, a potential we could do? He kept going back to the table. And then he said the rest was up to the Board of Finance and how we oh. would vote. But his position was the table is the table, and that's how I remember. Okay. I'm happy to ask, though, tomorrow if they want to put that so you could just see it, everybody could see it. Does that help? Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kupchak. Mr. Walsh, I kind of jumped in there, and I – well, I'll go back to you if you want to have follow up. I I actually think that somebody from Hooker and Holcomb should be on the phone on Monday, and a representative from Matt's firm. His firm's a large firm. They can have somebody else on the phone. I, I apologize that he. I feel bad because Matt's a great guy, uh, that he's is injured. Uh, but I think they should be able to get somebody, um, on the phone from their firm with all the work we do with them. Thank you, Mr. Walsh. I'm going to go to Mr. Mertola. You had a question? But I, I'm assuming they're going to pass it and pension board. And I thought our discussion the other night was 
something in line of we were going to probably be wiser to fully fund the pension, but maybe not fully fund OPED as an offset. I thought that's kind of what we were talking about. And I know we're going to have to discuss it some more, but I thought that's, that was the direction we were maybe leaning towards. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you, Mr. Matola. Um, Ms. Charlton had a question, and then Mr. I'll go to Mr. Bateson. Uh, yeah, just just to um, follow on to what Mr. Bateson said, and also Mr. Matola, and to clarify for the administration, uh, the the reaction to the two million cutting OPEB uh, by two million was connected to the pension because of the discussion Mr. Matola just described. Assuming that the pension board approves the new mortality table, that increases the ADEC for the pension 1.8 million. So one way to deal with that would be to reduce the OPEB contribution. So now you're already in the hole 1.8 million on the OPEB contribution and your suggestion would now add another 2 million to that. So that I think and, and Mr. Bateson can connect, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the point that, you know, we would already be going into OPEB for close to 2 million uh, as a result of adopting this mortality table. Um, and then just another point, I, I also, Mr. Brown, would like to uh, uh, clarify what I heard the other night was similar to what you heard and what Mr. Walsh said we're at 86% funding. We'd go down to 84% just with the mortality table, but the decline in the market value of the assets based on what we know they are today, because the 84% assumes our market value of the assets before the crash, which is irrelevant at this point. So if you take kind of the current value of our pension portfolio, which they say has declined roughly 10%, along with the liability, including this new mortality table, I heard 75%, and I think that was the concern that Mr. Walsh articulated. So just to hopefully, you know, for the public, for, for us, that, that clear, I hope that clarifies things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bateson? Yeah, thanks, Jim. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, quick thing. <laughs> uh, I read the New York Post, not the Wall Street Journal. So what are you guys talking about with this uh, Allianz thing? I've heard it a couple times tonight. Is there, is there something I don't know? I, I don't understand. So I think Walsh said something about sixteen million in Allianz. I, that, those are big numbers. Okay. Okay. Is so, it, so what did I would say, he say this, and I just didn't register the other night. Mr. Vahey, Mr. Vahey I don't fully mention a number. He is going to come before us on our quarterly meeting to discuss um, that item. However, however, it, it, I don't know, Mr. Bremer, um, do you, or Ms. Bossi, can you add anything, any specifics to it? I, I think I think that conversation specifically to Allianz would be best to have uh, an executive session because there's some there are many issues that Mr. Baldwin is looking into with other lawyers, and I think that conversation should be best had uh, in executive session. I, I don't think we need to do it tonight, but I think that should be certainly an executive session. Okay. Uh, uh, that that didn't sound good. Okay. And is there a dollar? I heard Wall say $16 million. Is that the dollar value associated with this? Approximately, yes. Approximately, yes. Okay, so that's 16 above and beyond the $40 million that were already down in market value on the pension. No, I think no, that's included think that's in the 40. In the 40. Okay. That makes me feel a little better. Thank you. 16 million 16 better. Million better. Okay. We'll discuss we'll more discuss when more we have when we facts in front of us, okay, and, and people that can speak to it. Any further questions on these documents? Okay. All right. Um, thank you to the finance department and Ms. Kupchak for putting this together for us. And what I'd like to do now is just turn it over to the board 
see if you have any further comments, questions on the budget. This is obviously our last meeting before we vote on Monday night. And if there's anything in general or some specifics that you would like to review, discuss, bring up, please feel free to do so. Ms. Charlton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Lori Charlton. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time or if, uh, if we discuss this Monday, if so, you can just cut me off. But since we're on the subject of revenue, I just wanted to raise maybe two points of concern for consideration um, in our budgeted revenue numbers. One being uh, the state grants. Uh, given the, the level of uncertainty at the state level, um, I think it would be prudent for us to recognize at least some level of risk, even if it's 5% on, um, on those state grants. So I, I know what we've been told. I also know what I've heard in terms of what's happening at the state level. And it's, um, I think it would be wise of this board to factor in some level of risk on, on the state grants. So that was one revenue item. Um, and, and the other one, um, you know, the other one I thought of was, well, two really. One on the health department, I, I thought uh, we might want to consider going back to a three-year average in that permit revenue, given what's happening in the restaurant industry. I, I, it's hard to believe that that revenue will increase next year as we have it budgeted. Uh, and lastly, I think that for some other departments, uh, I think TP&Z did it, but for conservation, I think we should have a reduction of permit revenue that's aligned with what we're doing with building revenue. So we can, I can offer up those things in detail on Monday, but um, I'm throwing those out because just in looking at the revenues, I, I think that's about four or $500,000 if you consider those items. So um, recognizing that we had some of the larger discussions already, I, I hope we can revisit those because, um, uh, you know, there's, there's estimation in here, I get it, with the tax rate, but th those are some risks that I think are, are are probably worth considering building in to our numbers. So, so, so I don't know if anyone else has thoughts, but I just want, I, while we're on the topic of revenue, I wanted to leave that out there. Thank you, Ms. Charles. But I just want to be, I just want to be clear. Are you suggesting that you would make a motion to reduce the revenue? Or are you just asking us to understand that it's at risk and we may have to make up if, if there is a shortfall with fund balance or some other method in case that revenue projections are off. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm saying that I think we should consider perhaps a motion Monday, but I wanted to throw that out there so that it, all of us on this board could consider it. I know we've spent a lot of time talking about revenue but as you go back through the list of revenue items, those were a few things that seemed, uh, you know, more obvious to me than trying to estimate a tax rate. And in particular, the state funding, I just, I don't know what it's going to be. I don't think any of us know, but I, I'm certain that we should build in some risk as we estimate our tax rate. And we should also not be projecting increases um, for things like, you know, restaurant permits where there's clearly, you know, um, if not a risk of decline, I, I certainly don't think we should be building increases in. So I think in terms of getting to, to accurate numbers, I, if, if everyone could just give that some thought, and if Monday's the right time to make that motion when we vote on expense items, then, then I can do that then. But I, I um, you know, if anyone else has thoughts now or Monday, you know, I'd, I hope we can discuss that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bowman, do you want to make any comments as town attorney on revenue? Yes, uh, this is Jim Baldwin. Uh, I'd be happy to. I, I looked into the issue uh, as I was asked to do so by, uh, by yourself, Jim. And um, in my view and my legal analysis, it is not an appropriate matter for this board to take up unilaterally. That is, if you look back at this board and how it's addressed revenue issues, particularly from departments, um, but not just departments, 
but revenues projections that they're provided with by the administration or by departments, it has always been adhered to by this board. And there is a good legal basis for that. The legal basis is that this board is supposed to consider appropriations in the context of projected re revenue, reasonable revenue, reasonable projections. And in my analysis, and based on the history, past history of the board, in the legal analysis, it is not a reasonable basis to go against the recommendations of the people who run those departments, or for that matter, the, uh, the administration, so long as those uh, grounds or those projections that you receive from them are reasonable. So if that is to say, um, I, I don't think it, it stands, it would stand the scrutiny if it ever got to that point in a court of law. Okay, so now I have two, two other lawyers raising their hands and I'll, I'll yeah. start with Mr. Um, let me go to Mr. Matola first. I mean, I, I don't agree with what you just said, Mr. Baldwin, quite frankly. I don't think it's a legal question at all. It's, and I think this board has made revenue adjustments throughout the years on, on revenue projections. So uh, I, I just don't know why you're going there, quite frankly. So that's all I have to say. Well, if I can respond to that, Jim Baldwin, uh, the, the board has never gone against the recommendations based on my review of the last three budget seasons. And I don't know if anyone here can remember going against budget projections. That is not to say that the board does not have the ability to, um, to ask questions and cajole department heads and, and uh, get them to agree that a number uh, that is different from the one they projected is or would be reasonable. But unless they do so, you're, you're inserting your reasons above theirs, and, and that's where I think it, it, it crosses the line. And it hasn't been done before. It's, it's kind of a, it's a slippery slope, and it's a dangerous, dangerous thing in, in terms of, you know, how the town has been run. Mr. Walsh? Hey. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Matol, you had follow-up? Go ahead, Mr. Matol. Okay, Mr. Walsh. Um, I have to uh, agree with Mr. Matola. I, I don't agree with this. Um, Mr. Baldwin, you have a legal memorandum of this where you can give us case law in examination of our charter and the statutes? I could do that if you want me to. Definitely um, want you to. Definitely want you to. Because um, I, I feel like this is like a power grab of some sort by the administration. That's I'm just telling you my personal feelings. Um, we've done this before. We've done it before. I know we've done it almost every single year um, with Betsy Brown's conveyance taxes because we always think that she's uh, – that maybe we know better. And I think the numbers have tried to show that when we've increased her uh, conveyance tax revenue line items, We've never missed, not one time. And I think we've probably done it seven years in a row. Yeah, well, I think you're so, maybe missing, if I may, Jim Baldwin again, I think maybe you're missing my point. Every time, and I spoke with uh, Betsy about it, and I spoke with uh, Anthony and, and Tom, every time that you did make a change to the revenues, and I'm not saying that didn't happen, I'm not saying you don't vote to change what was initially presented by of the Board of Selectmen to this board. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that every time that you have made a change, it has been with the acquiescence or agreement of that department head member, including Betsy Brown. And Betsy Brown was prepared to, to address this very fact tonight and, and attest to that fact because, you know, it, I find it to be important and significant. It's never been done before unilaterally by this board. I don't remember ever asking anybody for permission. We just make the make the change. 
um, I, to be honest with what you. What happens so, is that you, you, uh, you elicit uh, an agreement by that department head saying, yes, I could, I could live with that, and I think, therefore, you know, that would be reasonable. It would not be unreasonable. Well, I don't, that's what so has happened. That has not happened, to my knowledge, uh, during this budget cycle. Betsy, Betsy comes to us and presents her her numbers, and then on the budget night, we do what we want to do on both revenue and expenses. That's what yeah. happens. Betsy's Walsh, not there for the vote. Mr. Walsh, I'll, I'll, I'll present to you the history of the last three budgets, and I could probably, if you want, I'll go back through more, and I think you'll find that what I am saying is accurate. But then, Mr. Baldwin, why do we even get the revenue projection? We shouldn't even see it then. No, because the you Board of tell, Finance... You should tell us one number. You should tell us one number. The administration tells us what their revenue projection number is. And we don't have a right to, to change it. So why would we even go through the process of going through it? Because... That, that's not accurate. The, the process is to get it right and to find out what is reasonable and what are the best projections. And everybody knows that from the time that uh, the budget process starts to the point where it gets before this board, changes can occur. And in past practice, when those changes do occur, it's brought to the attention of the board by the responsible department head or the administration. and and those changes are appropriately implemented. The duty, the, the responsibility of this board is to appro make the appropriations and to cut areas if you think that it's, it's, that appropriation is excessive for any reason. But it's and not, part of the, part of the, and, and it must be based, it must be based or balanced against uh, what are reasonable expectations for revenue. And, now, and that's our decision, what they are, to be able to make the proper appropriations. We need to know and we need to feel feel justified in what those numbers are after extensive questioning and whether yes. we choose that they're lower or higher. And this is a perfect year to talk about this because you now have a pandemic. The Board of Selectmen gave us numbers. If I may, Mr. Walsh, respond to what you're saying. I, I don't disagree with you. But the fact is that the Board of Selectmen gave you numbers, and those numbers, as has happened numerous times in the past, changed since the Board passed those numbers. And pursuant to that, the numbers presented to you by those department heads changed. But they, these numbers are guesses in most instances, and they admit that they're just blind guesses. No, I, I, to the contrary, I, I, I don't accept that because I think that's the whole basis for me saying that it's reasonably based. It's based on their experience and their, their expertise, if you will. I think if, if there's any, any speculation or blind speculation being done, it would not be on their part. Oh, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't agree with that. I mean, even, even when Mr. Bremer came to us with numbers, he just reduced categories by 20%. We asked him how he got that. I had to choose a number, is what he told us. I, I don't think it's correct. I'd like to see your legal memorandum. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm going to make motions based on the way we've normally done it. If you want to challenge that in court, I guess you can. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm suggesting that if you do it the way you've normally done it, you would um, you would adhere to past practice, and that is accepting the numbers that were presented to you by the department heads when you uh, brought them before you, not once but twice in most instances. I think tonight was the third opportunity. And, and by the way, they were all prepared to address this issue, so I'm sorry they're not on. Well, they're, they're, they're not on. Okay. And we heard a lot of evidence, but I mean, to be quite honest with you, with Mr. Conley's numbers, I know he said to go to a three-year average. He also made a case on why they know why his numbers should be increased, actually, based on the projects he was talking about in his conversations with them. So that's a perfect example of why he's. Oh, I want to try to save a little bit, so I don't whatever. But he made a strong, a very
very strong case of why his revenue projection should be increased. Well, that's, that's fine, because your, your job is to balance those projected revenues with the appropriations that are your purview. So, so on, on that side of the coin, uh, then, then you should feel fine. It's, it's when you go in the other direction, I think, that, that you're, 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 you're really going against past practice. Has there been a case on point on this that's gone up to any appellate court or the Connecticut Supreme Court on this matter? No, but I, exactly. uh, most of the cases <laughs> deal with boards of education, but they do address it. And, and, and I'll address it for you, Mr. Walsh, if you'd like me to, and I, I look forward to citing a, a case in particular, but uh, I, I won't go there. I'll, I'll move on from my group. Ms. Charlton has a question, Ms. Brown, I'll move on. Then, yeah, I just want to make sure I understand something and, and then I want to uh, turn it over to Mrs. Claire. So in this particular, just let's get specific. We have building, building permits. And the administration, probably through Mr. Conley, I'm not sure, has made a recommendation to reduce the projected revenue by $273,000, right? Because of COVID. So if we made a motion and it was approved to increase that revenue by that same 273,000 and Mr. Conley disagreed with us and we went and voted anyway and it was approved, Mr. Baldwin, are you saying that would be a legal issue? I, I can't say whether or not it would be a legal issue. I can say whether or not I think it would be appropriate. Okay, but would we have the authority, in, you know, what we're talking about, I think, is the authority of the Board of Finance to make that adjustment. Would we have the authority, the legal authority, to make that adjustment, whether it was appropriate or not? Ultimately, my view is if there was a harm done, and there was a claim behind it, I, I don't think that it would be considered legally. Whether or not that situation would arise is another question. I, I hope that makes sense. You know, I mean, consider the fact that the RTM can, can vote by charter to increase cuts that you've made, but there's nothing that speaks to this issue. And I think that's because this is an issue that is not supposed to rise to the representative town meeting level. It shouldn't have to go there because it's not appropriate. It's, it's, it's just not. If it were, then that would be something else that perhaps our charter would need to provide for. Your job, okay, is, appropriate. Your job is appropriations primarily based on reasonable revenue estimates. Your job is not to, I'm sorry, uh, you know, second guess those estimates for revenue which have been reasonably based, that have a reasonable basis. Okay, so I just want to make sure I, I understand. And then I'll go to Ms. So do we have the, if he disagreed, would it stand in your opinion? Ultimately, no, in my opinion, it would not. If, if there was a vehicle to, to challenge it, if that happened. Okay, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, Mrs. LeClaire, you had your hand up. I, I just wanted to follow up that um, as far as I can remember, we have always adjusted revenue items and voted on the revenue as, as in total. So I don't see why we wouldn't be able to adjust it up and down as we needed to. Jim Baldwin again, the, the reason is because every time you have done so, it has been based on the presentation made by the department head or the administration reflecting changes in projected revenues. It's never happened unilaterally by this board. 
to my knowledge. And, and I've gone back and looked, and if somebody wants to, to, uh, to look further and or give me an example where that was not the case, I welcome it. But I, I, I looked into it for, uh, for quite a while the other night, and I couldn't find any. And I also checked with those people who uh, have been doing this for a long time, and they all confirmed it's never happened in their tenure. Follow-up, Mary? Thank you, Jim. No, I'm good. Thanks. Uh, Ms. Charlton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Baldwin, I, I certainly did not intend to uh, open up a can of worms or uh, intend to offend anyone. I... Um, the reason I raise these three particular items is that we may have touched on them initially in our early budget meetings, but these are a couple items that we have not, in fact, really gone back to revisit. So the reason I raise them, and I welcome the administration's comments because I'm not, you know, trying to second guess or disregard any anything that they believe. I certainly respect their experience and their knowledge, but. You know, we, we really did not rediscuss state grants. And that's, that's something, you know, these are, all the revenue numbers I described have not really been revisited. They were estimates that were made pre-pandemic when we were in a very different place. And in some cases, for example, I, I mentioned conservation. The only reason I raised that is as I was looking at the analysis, I thought, it just didn't seem sensible to, uh, you know, reduce one set of permits and a related set of permits not reduce because they kind of go together. Uh, same with with restaurants uh, or health. You know, that is that is an estimate that was made pre-pandemic when we were in a very different place. So, again, I'm I don't think that we debated these things, and and I'm trying to disagree with the administration because I'm trying to second guess them. You know, we have had some healthy debates on tax collection rate, and I'm sure we have different views, and, you know, we'll, it'll be what it is. But I, I mentioned these because we've, we've had a lot of meetings. We've discussed a lot of things. We're, we're at, I'm at the wire now. And in the final analysis and looking at these last items, I, I thought that these were uh, items that stood out that were worth revisiting, and, and I don't believe that we've really revisited or challenged those particular items, and they do add up. So, um, again, not at all looking to second guess uh, the administration or, or you know, disregard what they're saying, but I, I think these are, um, you know, again, pre-pandemic numbers that are uh, have very likely been affected by the situation that we found ourselves in, that we find ourselves in now, and that is why I raised them. Um, and I, I guess, again, being a newer member on the board, I, I can't comment on history, and I, I agree that our, our role may be primarily appropriations, but it's, it's also just a mill rate, and, and the two go together. Um, you know, evaluating the reasonableness of revenues is. Is, is the other half of the equation. So I, I don't, um, I'm not sure I really understand that view, uh, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Charlton. Uh, Mr. Walsh? Mr. Brown, did you ask for this opinion by Mr., did you start this ball rolling about whether we can look at revenue with Mr. Baldwin? Because he suggested that you did. So, when I was speaking about revenue with the administration, a comment was made to me about whether we had the authority to adjust revenue. Who made that comment in the administration? Ms. Ms. Gardner. Ms. And Gardner. so based okay. on that- She based never on made that, that comment to us in the past. Well, based, based on that comment, I called Mr. Baldwin, and I told Ms. Garner that I would call Mr. Baldwin. And based on that conversation, um, as Mr. Baldwin said, he went back and did and did his research. 
Let me talk. And came to the conclusion, which we just talked to this afternoon um, about it. He, he came to, you know, he explained the conclusion that he's explaining to us right now. So when Ms. Charlton brought up revenue, I turned it over to Mr. Baldwin so we could we could talk about this right now. How are we learning about this on the last night of, a, of, of an entire season? We're learning about this for the first time at between 9.30 and 10 o'clock on the last meeting we have. Um, Linda, wanted, when did you first raise this issue and how, why did you raise the issue? Hi, Jim. Yes. Um, Jim, all of our revenue adjustments in the past have been um, in agreement. And I, when uh, I was talking to your chairman, I was afraid that there would be a widespread cut without a rationale to many revenue lines. And uh, I just brought it to uh, his attention that all revenue cuts in the past had been made in agreement with department heads. I've gone back to 2012, and remember I give you a cut, I call it the cut schedule, the cut sheet and the control sheet. Um, I looked at those going back to at least 2012. There, there have been handfuls of revenue adjustments made, and I always provided a comment. And it would say, with approval of TC, meaning town clerk. Or I would say, building uh, director recommended this. Or we got a bid in once for a concession, and it was the updated bid number. So it, it was things like that. I was worried because you people had, in your judgment, created a process for the revenue to be justified either by an, uh, uh, an estimate that we are provided by documentation or three-year average failing that or a calculation. And I didn't want a, um, a methodology, a different methodology to enter that, did, that was not based on a rationale, either one of those or the agreement with the, and, and the agreement of the department head. Okay, um, Linda, let me ask you a question, because I've made adjustments to conveyance tax on the night yes, we have. vote. On the night we yes. vote. Betsy's not there. Betsy's not no. there. No. She's not there. So no. We don't call she, her up and ask her, is this okay, Betsy? Is this okay if I add on 50000 or $100,000 of conveyance tax? I don't ask her permission, nor is she in the room. It's either been asked in the previous meeting or she's acquiesced in some way, according That's to my comments. Oh, well, okay. you, your comments are wrong because we can pull the actual meeting notes and the minutes, and she's not in the room. She's not in the room. So I'm not asking her permission, Betsy, is this okay? We don't do it that way, Linda. You know we don't do it that way. We call a vote. We call for cuts, or our chairman, Mr. Flynn, has called in the past and said, does anybody have any changes to revenue? How you Mr. Walsh, yes. I'd like to raise the commands tax revenue by $50,000. All in favor? Anybody second? Yes. All in favor? So that's false, what you're saying. That's not my recollection, Jim. And my okay. notes that okay. were contentious. Anybody else on this notes? call been at board meetings before? Anybody been at budget meetings? Is that the way we've done it in the past? Anybody who's been on past meetings? Okay, so let me, let me, let me speak to this. I do remember absolutely the way Mr. Walsh does, which is why I asked Mr. Baldwin to look into it because we have changed revenue. Now, I, I can't, you know, I can't recall was Betsy there or Betsy not there or whatever. I'm sure at some point we spoke about it just like we would have tonight. But 
as as an elected body, as a board of finance, I remember voting to change revenue. Yes, Mr. Dewitt. I'm just. I was just going to say. I, I recall changing at least being asked if we wanted to change revenue and there are circumstances where we have and and i can also tell you that there were um at least one circumstance where our board changed the collection rate and that's there's nothing more effective revenue than the collection rate change right so i remember it as mr walsh does Ms. claire do you recall anything Yes, we've, we've changed revenue, and we've always voted on revenue. Have we asked people's opinion about it on the night sometimes, of the vote? Sometimes, sometimes not. On the night of the vote, no. Mr. Matola, Ms. Marmon, you've been on. What are you, what's your recollection? I am somewhat flabbergasted by what I'm hearing. I, I believe it's our role to look at revenue, and exactly. we've adjusted accordingly so i this is um i'm flabbergasted uh yeah I, I don't disagree we, we've done it that way in the past we made adjustments all right i don't think we asked permission to do it either okay so at this point um with mr baldwin we'll just have to wait for a follow-up from you Can you hear me? Yes. Can I just address some of the points that were made just to clarify the issue? Because I think yes. people are missing the point. If I may, it's not a question of whether you ask somebody at the final budget meeting where that vote took place. I'm not suggesting that those votes did not take place. What I am saying is that in every such case, it was based on the opinion being ratified or that changed number being ratified and endorsed by the department head, not necessarily on the night of the vote on which it was taken, but at some point during the budget process, that was communicated by the department head or the administration, and that was the basis for the change in revenue. And the minutes are replete with situations that reflect that. And yes, there are there are minutes which don't entirely reflect it, but that's because of the nature of the minutes being taken. With that being said, if you were to ask Mr. Connolly, Ms. Brown, uh, and Anthony uh, whether any such increases or decreases ever occurred without their acquiescence, the universal answer is no. I just want to make that clear. And, and how would we know whether um, people aren't going to acquiesce any change we make now? You, it's a good question. It's why, it's why, Mr. Walsh, it's why those people were on the phone tonight. And to Ms. Charlton's point, if there are more questions, it is absolutely, without a doubt, the purview of this board to cross-examine and to inquire and to make you know, points and to, to try to elicit from those people, you know, what they really think, if you don't think they're telling you the truth, or, or you know, get them to agree that maybe a different number would be reasonable. And, and that's the way it's happened in the past. And that is absolutely the purview of this board. I, 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 I want to make that clear. It is your purview to do that. And that's why they come before you. And that's why they were here tonight. But if we follow our same procedure we've been following, and on Monday night, we start making changes to revenue, why wouldn't, what's, how will we know whether they're going to acquiesce or not after the fact? You know what they presented to you, Mr. Walsh. And yeah, tonight, yeah, And tonight there was an opportunity for, for them to be asked questions again if Ms. Charlton and others had questions for them about those projections that's that's the purpose of these meetings yeah and, it would have been nice to have this opinion beforehand 
before they left the meeting. You you have their opinions if if you want to ask them. No, questions. your legal your legal opinion. All of a sudden, we have a change in how we all think this works. But the members who have previously been on here, Miss Marmion, it's never, she's flabbergasted. Never worked, I'm flabbergasted. It's never worked any differently than how I describe it. In fact, the slippery slope that you are on right now is a radical change to how things have been done in the past. That's the slippery slope. We're, we're in a pandemic. Where does it end? Right, let me just jump to Mr. Bateson. Ed, Ed Bateson. Yeah, I'm here. Uh, this conversation for the past 15 minutes is just beyond me. I, I don't even know what slippery slope. What am I? What am I missing? I, I don't. I'm with all you guys. I, I, I am going to disregard the last 15 minutes of everything I just heard. Monday night, if I want to adjust revenue and there's basis to do it, I say we do it. If we want to reduce revenue and there's a basis to do it, let's do it. I, I'm not saying what we we've been elected to do what we think is reasonable. I mean, and to Walsh's point, I, I, I heard something in a couple of presentations where there might be room to go a little higher. If that's our discretion, I say we do it. If the department head, it sounds like the, what's new here is that the department head objects, the administration is going to take us to court. If that's what they want to do, so be it. But, I mean, if, if my good judgment leads me to believe that there might be more revenue out there that isn't being recognized, I'm voting to recognize it. That's where I am. I don't care what the lawyers say. Okay. Um, Mr. Walsh. I agree with much of Mr. Bateson says, and if this has to be a case of first impression, so be it. Um, at least the rest of the state will know whether they can adjust um, revenue items. But it could be a great case of first impression. But I'd say we do what we've always done and continue to do it the way we want to do it. Okay, hold on. Um, thank you, Mr. Walsh. I've got people texting me from every which way, okay, at this point. I just want to say, and Mr. Flynn, who's the chairman of our board, wants to weigh in. I need someone to get him the number. So he can dial into this thing and he's allowed to speak as ex officio. So can someone get Tom Flynn the number so he could call in to this meeting? Not not the number where he's with the public that they cannot unmute and call in. So in the meantime, let me go to Ms. Charlton. Oh, I didn't have a question. I was just saying I'd be I'd be happy to uh, forward this number to Tom Flynn, if you needed somebody to do it. Yeah. Mr. Brown, can I just jump in here a second? I think I think this has gotten a little sort of off the rails. Um, I think, you know, there was a comment made by uh, a member of our finance department who's been with the town a really long time. And I think what Mr. Baldwin was just trying to say is that there was no real evidence of the of the Board of Finance making sweeping changes to revenues um, unless there was some reasonable, you know, like the, like I'll say, for example, at our Board of Selectmen meeting, Mr. Flynn was trying to push the town clerk to raise her revenues um, on, on conveyance. And he was pushing her and pushing her, and she said, no, I don't feel comfortable. And we, we, we didn't do it. So I think what might be happening here is that there's a misunderstanding between people. And I think what Mr. Baldwin is just trying to say, that everybody seems to got their panties in a twist a bit, is that, you know, people listen to a department head who works in that department every single day, year after year, to say, you know what, I think my conveyance is going to be up this year. Or like Betsy mentioned, during several of these meetings, you know, I, I'm getting a lot of conveyance, so I think we're doing pretty good. And Tom Conley said, you know, I'm getting a lot of people want to put built-in swimming pools and make their backyards really nice this summer because they know they can't travel. Or, 
you know, there's some level of experience that comes from department heads who actually work there and understand the day-to-day -day operations. And I think all he's saying is there isn't usually these big sweeping changes to revenue. And I think maybe there was just a misunderstanding of how, what was being said. And no one is trying to threaten a lawsuit or, I mean, that's just silly, but... Um, Listen. I, I thought tonight was supposed to be about deliberations on the actual budget. I thought we were going to be going through the budget book and talking about numbers, and it's, we haven't really done that at all, and it's 10.30 at night. All right. You know what? Let me tell you something, everybody. I run the meeting the way I want to run the meeting. I, I go through documents what I want to go through. I had no intention of going through the budget book line by line. I wanted a conversation based on what, where, what direction we thought we might want to go. This revenue discussion, since it came up, is an important discussion because what we're talking about is the authority of a board of finance and what we are allowed or not allowed by authority to do. And it, need, it needs to be addressed because it sets precedent. And that is the concern. And I think this is a worthwhile discussion, at least for the next couple of minutes, and then we can move on. So, Mr. Flynn, are you on? Okay. Uh, Jeff, he's, got the doc, he's got the instructions. I think you can process the call in. Mr. Matola? I, I, I just... I don't know why you're bringing this up tonight because I know. We, 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 we don't generally make sweeping changes to the revenue. And I don't think this board, and I'm speaking for myself, I don't think we were going to make sweeping changes to the revenue uh, for this coming year either. I just, I just don't know why we're having this discussion right now. I don't know why it was even brought up, period. Thank you, Mr. Matola. You know what I want to do is is move forward from this. Hello. We heard Mr. Hello. Baldwin's. Hold on, hold on, everybody, hold on. We heard Mr. Baldwin's opinion, and the fact is, this will not get completely settled tonight. Okay. So, Mr. Flynn, are you on? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, interesting discussion. Thank you for recognizing me. I felt compelled to call in uh, just as being chair for the last 10 years. We have in almost every year adjusted revenue uh, from my memory, sometimes with the approval or, as someone said, the acquiescence of the department head, and sometimes not. Um, there's always been a rationale behind it. Um, I wouldn't say that it's always been significant dollars. Uh, sometimes we put in stretch goals or better available information has come in between the time the budget book was printed and the time the Board of Finance voted, much like what's happening here with the pandemic where there's a significant change. Um, this has never been challenged, and I actually was talking with Mr. Kiley, who's the immediate past uh, chair to me this evening, and it was never challenged during his tenure as well. And in addition, and, and what's astounding about the conversation, um, is we're really talking about a fairly small portion of the revenue budget uh, because the largest portion of the revenue budget is in fact set by this town because it's the tax rate. And we have, when we set the mill rate, uh, adjusted revenue, uh, both for collection rate as well as the mill rate itself. So even if this body were determined that for some reason you couldn't adjust uh, or shouldn't adjust the revenue rates by all these other town departments, you could still adjust the revenue rates by adjusting the mill rate, which is well over 90% of the taxable income or relative income to the town. So if you felt that you disagreed with the revenue rates, you could adjust the mill rates accordingly when you set the mill rate. That was typically done in May, but obviously this is a different year. So from that point, the discussion, while not moot, is not as important 
Um, and that's why I don't understand the consternation with it. But I just wanted to set the record straight, uh, having been there for so many years and having worked with the department heads. And I can't in, in, in any instance remember us doing something uh, when I was on the board that wasn't rooted in fact and rooted in analysis um, that was brought forward. So thank you, and I'll go back on mute. I think we all agree with that. The question before us on this revenue, this non-tax revenue, is the authority of the Board of Finance, okay? But yet we've never gone off the rails with it, most likely never will, but still it's about the authority as, as small as the numbers that we may be speaking to. What is the authority of the Board of Finance to adjust them against a department head's opinion? Okay. Any further comments? We're going to move on from this. Any further comments about the budget itself, expenses, um, on any item, on any department? Okay. I am seeing none. So, with that said, I need to go to item, it's a new item five on the agenda, to go into executive session. Can I have a motion to add that to the agenda? Mr. Matola, second by Mr. DeWitt. All in favor? It is unanimous. So this item is now on our, on our agenda. So I'm going to make a motion that we go into executive session that the board enter executive session to discuss the following matters, liability and personnel. And first, the board invites the following individuals into executive session. Mr. DeWitt, Mr. Testani, Ms. Claire, Ms. Charlton, Mr. Batola, Mr. Walsh, Ms. Marmion, and Mr. Bremer. Can I have... Well, the ex-officios are allowed to be on, right, in there? And ex-officios are allowed. So if Mr. Flynn would like to be in there, he, he's more than welcome. I missed Okay. Can I have a motion? I'll second your motion. Okay. Mr. DeWitt seconds. All those in favor? Mr. Bateson and Mr. Bateson, thank you for your text. Mr. Kelly, make sure we add Mr. Bateson. Okay, so Mr. Kelly, put us in uh, executive session, please. All right, I'll take just a second. This line is now on hold. The recording has started. Can I have a motion to take us out of private executive session, please? Ms. Charlton, seconded by Mr. Walsh. All those in favor? Say aye. It is unanimous. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions or comments about the budget? Okay, moving to item number six, to hear, consider, and act upon any communication. Ms. Ms. Bossy, Mr. Bremer, do you have any? No, we're done. No. Okay. Very good. So it's 11.05, it's fairly early for us. We're done. So we'll talk more about this on, um, on Monday, but I just want to thank you all for all the work that you've done. Thank you to the board. Thank you to the finance department, Ms. Kupchak, for the information. And we have tomorrow, this weekend, Sunday is Mother's Day. So happy Mother's Day to all, the, all you mothers and I guess grandmothers as well. And um, we'll have Monday, Monday night, um, and we'll bring this to a vote at 7.30. We still need some more, some information um, from the Board of Ed, 
from the finance department, and then of course we'll have to see what happens with the pension board and their vote at four o'clock. And just a reminder, we want to speak with H and H before we vote on Monday. And Mr. Spurndell's firm. Yes. Oh, is he, is he the one that was hurt? You, you're talking about from yes. the company? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we wish him well. Okay, so thank you. And look, appreciate the time. I don't know how many meetings we have, but I think I'll go back and count them up. But we had more than a few. And, you know, our job will be to make a recommendation to the RTM. Is it 10? Eight. How many? I think we had eight meetings. I feel like it was a lot more than eight, but <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm not counting the, the the meeting with us in one room and everyone else on the, the screen. Between the special meetings, these meetings, remember oh, we had well, one meeting in March. I think it was eight <laughs> nights, so maybe, maybe that's that's more accurate, right? Thousand meetings, <laughs> a lot of meetings. So we put a lot of time in this, but again. Um, you know, I, I think this board did its due diligence. It, it asked the it asked the right questions. Uh, it was a post pandemic budget that we had to had to deal with, and and we we dealt with it. So we still have a lot of work between now and Monday, and um, I'm sure we will be in communication and on how we want to proceed. So Monday night we'll be uh, we'll be ready for the public and we'll be ready for our vote. So thank you very much, everybody, and we'll talk soon. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Mr. Walsh, second by Mr. Testani. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Okay. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.